touch. Ronnie touched them instead. Watching him, she gripped them between her thumbs and forefingers, tugging at them, massaging them as she watched his gaze darken further, his expression becoming heavy with the intensity of his arousal. I can do that. He swallowed tightly. I know you can, she agreed her breath catching as a bolt of sensation shot from her nipples to her cunt. Take your jeans off, Tabor. Let me see if I arouse you. He began to rise. No, don't stand up. Remove them while you watch me. He hesitated, obviously fighting for breath, for control. Ronnie lowered her hands from her nipples, smoothing her palms down her stomach until they came to the loosened front of her jeans. Quickly, Tabor loosened his own, she smiled back at him, loving the game they were playing, wondering who would lose control first. She pushed the material, allowing them to slide leisurely from her thighs, then down her legs. She kicked the material from her feet, her mouth drying out as she watched Tabor do the same. She had made an error in judgment. Each time they had come together, she hadn't had time to truly look at the amazing organ that brought her to such pinnacles of pleasure— but now she did. It rose to his navel, nearly as thick as her wrist, as bronzed as the rest of his body and throbbing with a life of its own. The mushroom-shaped head was tapered for maximum penetration, flowing to a wider base and heavily veined shaft. No wonder he drove her crazy with the edge of pain that followed the rapturous pleasure. His cock, like his body, was built for endurance— and right now, she wanted nothing more than to endure its presence within her steamy cunt. But she was going to wait. Tabor stared at her with a challenge glowing in his eyes as his fingers wrapped around the erect stalk. Ronnie licked her lips as he massaged himself, his fingers stroking from the heavy hood to the base of the shaft. Come here, he whispered, his voice dark, rich with sexual demand. No, she drawled softly as she went to her knees before him. I told you, Tabor, I want to stroke you. Damn. He jerked in reaction as she leaned forward, her tongue licking over the hot head of his erection. His hips flexed, driving it against her lips as a strangled groan ripped from his chest. Ronnie, God, baby. His chest was rising and falling violently with the force of his breathing. Perspiration gleamed on the powerful muscles, making his skin look satiny, warm, and vibrant. She licked the head of his cock again, slowly, easily, watching his eyes, his expression as he grimaced in rising need. The sharp canines at the sides of his mouth gleamed wickedly, giving him a decidedly sexy, dangerous appearance. Ronnie, I won't make it, he panted, his voice tight, regretful, tortured. I'm going to lose my control, baby. I can't stand it. Can't you? She brushed his fingers out of the way, her own hand attempting to surround the burgeoning flesh of his cock. Poor baby. Then how will you handle this? Her mouth covered the thick head, stretching over it, sucking him inside as her tongue began to rub, stroke, and tease the ultra-sensitive, hard throb of flesh just beneath the hooded crown. The throttled, animalistic growl that tore from his throat had her womb clenching, her sex flooding with moisture and heat. The man within had always stayed in control, had always maintained a delicate balance in their sexual encounters. Ronnie knew she was tempting, daring the animal to break free and she couldn't wait to show him he had met his match in her. Chapter 19 She was beautiful. There were no other words to describe the soft glow of passion in Ronnie's blue eyes, the flush of need on her cheeks, her reddened lips stretching around his erection. Too beautiful too damned innocent and too hot for what she was tempting. But there was no way in hell he was going to push her away. He kept his hands bunched into the cushions of the couch, his eyes narrowed as she watched him with a siren's gaze. 
his body tortured as her tongue continued to tempt the primal barb hidden just under the skin into revealing itself. He could feel the presence of the unnatural extension. It throbbed, pulsed, fought to be free even as he fought to hold it back. God, he wanted it to last forever. From the seductive, lingering caresses of her mouth, it appeared she did as well. There was no frantic suckling, no indication that she wasn't enjoying every second of touching him, as he did touching her. Oh, yeah, he moaned as her tongue rimmed beneath the flared head, stroking and probing, learning every curve and rise of his straining flesh. Good, baby, so good. He flexed his hips, pushing his flesh farther into her mouth. Her moan vibrated around it her fingers tightening as her tongue flattened and stroked what she could of his turgid cock. Heat surrounded him, moist, slick heat. Her tongue was like a silken demon running rampant, her lips a snug, gripping pleasure. Heaven, because nothing had ever felt so good. Hell, because the fight to restrain the explosion building in his scrotum was nearly more than he could bear. Damn, Ronnie. He could feel the sweat building on his skin as snaking fingers of pleasure wrapped around his cock and the tightened sack beneath. Tingles of sensation chased up his spine, enclosing his scalp with static sensitivity. He groaned weakly as her lips dragged back up the small amount of flesh she held in her mouth, caressing over the head, then leaving it entirely as her tongue swirled over the tip. Tabor pushed up to her mouth, groaning with the need to have her envelop him again. A little tease. Her teeth scraped gently, adding a sharper sensation, but no less pleasurable before her tongue laved over it again. He couldn't stand it. His cock was throbbing like a wound, his scrotum tightening, pulsating with the need to release the built-up sperm. Beneath the head of his erection, the barb flexed, desperate to lock inside the hot depths of her pussy as he spilled his seed. But not yet. He wasn't ready to come yet. He wanted to feel her mouth again, hot, liquid fire, her tongue a stroke of seductive agony. Tabor lifted his hands to her head, fingers spearing into her hair, gripping the silken strands, relishing the dominance of his hold on her. He stared into her challenging gaze, his own narrowing as the man willingly gave over to the animal in that single, undefined second. She was his mate. She could challenge him, tempt him, but he was too close to the edge for her teasing little games now. The flare of excitement in her gaze and her expression assured him that it affected her just as deeply. Suck it. The hard growl accompanied the slow slide of his cock back in her mouth, she enclosed it firmly, willingly, though she strained against his hold just enough to satisfy the need he had to maintain the edge of dominance. She moaned again. The sound echoed around the portion of his erection trapped within her mouth, causing the entire shaft to pulse, the hidden barb to press closer to revealing itself. Spearing shards of pleasure shot into his balls as the muscles of his abdomen clenched in spasmodic reaction. Sweet heaven. He fucked slowly into her mouth, holding her hair in a firm grip, relishing the snug drag of her lips, the flickering whip of her tongue. And all the while he watched her. Watched her eyes darken, her cheeks hollowing out, her lips sliding over his cock. Oh, yeah, there you go, baby, he groaned as he rocked slowly back and forth, every muscle in his body tightening as he fought his release. Suck it, Ronnie, suck it deeper, baby. He pushed back, filling her mouth, fighting not to breach her barrier of comfort and taking him. Her tongue flattened further along his cock, rasping tissue so sensitive he wanted to roar with the pleasure of it. Her moan of protest as he slid a bit too far had him pulling back in regret. She could take more. He knew she could. God help him, he needed her to. Breathe through your nose. Relax. 
he panted roughly, staring down into her wide eyes, gauging if it was fear or excitement lighting them. He prayed he was right and it was excitement. He felt the hot depths of her mouth relax marginally, her tongue losing a bit of its desperate tension. Yes, he hissed in pleasure. You can take more, Ronnie. Just relax, baby. Relax. He slid slowly inside her mouth as he chanted the word to her. She took the smallest amount more, enough to have him shaking, shivering, and quaking pleasure as he watched his shaft sliding into her mouth. God, how much more could he stand? More. His demand was rough, rough enough that for an immeasurable second he fought the need rioting through him. Then he sank in further, nearly to the convulsive swallowing at the entrance of her throat. There he was. God, yes, that was it. He couldn't see his cock fucking into her mouth now, but the sensations of it were so extreme he decided he could do without it. He rested his head on the back of the couch, fucking her mouth with short, desperate strokes as the suckling, moist sound of it enclosing him had him groaning with each breath, fighting his orgasm with everything inside him. Ronnie, he whispered desperately, unable to hold back the words, the sensations tearing through him. God, yes, suck it. Suck me, baby, just like that. He could smell her heat now. She was so aroused, the sweet, earthy scent of her lust wrapped around his senses, drowning him in it. Her moans were another caress on his cock. Her fingers gripping him, stroking the shaft, were pushing him past his limits of control. The barb was a fierce, agonizing throb that he knew he couldn't hide forever. But not yet. He didn't want her to know, didn't want to chance her fear and disgust. Enough. He pulled her back, ignoring her protesting cry, fighting his own need to surge back inside the exquisite heat. The moist clamp of her mouth was paradise, but he knew it was one he could not yet fully enjoy. Tabor. Her voice was a thready, needy sound that had his erection twitching in barbaric demand. Fuck me, Ronnie. She was kissing his abdomen, her tongue licking as he held her back from the surging strength of his cock. Now, damn it, I can't wait, baby. He pulled her back into his lap, spreading her legs over his, lifting her, holding her close, then pushing her relentlessly down onto his raging cock. Oh, God. His cry joined hers as he worked the thick shaft into the ultra-tight recess of her blistering pussy. Hot, so hot, so sweet and slick. He pushed deeper, holding her as she arched in his arms, fighting to take more, her cry echoing through the dim room. Her cunt was a vice of slippery, flexing, torturous pleasure. The muscles clamped on him, fighting to accept him, to relax around the girth, spreading them apart. Nothing had ever been so erotic, so filled with lust and tempestuous sexuality. Take it, he growled, pressing her closer, feeling the protesting tissue grip and convulse as she fought to accept him. All of it, Ronnie, now take it, baby. He thrust harder inside her, spearing into her, feeling her pussy part, take, accept, until he had buried every throbbing, desperate inch of his cock inside the fist-tight grip of her suddenly shuddering, exploding cunt. It was too much. Too much heat, too much need welling up inside him, tormenting him. He heard his own cry shattering the air, felt the emergence of the barb, the scalding pulse of his semen, and died in her arms. There was no other way to explain it. His soul exploded with the tip of his cock, spewing out an emotion and need, a compulsive hunger as thick, hot, and life-giving as the semen winging its way to her fertile, hungry womb. Chapter 20 When are you going to tell me what's wrong with your cock? The lazy tone of Ronnie's voice didn't fool him for a minute, he could hear the steely determination in her voice that had marked more than half his conversations with her over the years. The word cock, whispering so seductively from her lips, had that particular portion of his anatomy twitching in interest. 
Hmm, you didn't seem to think anything was wrong with it when you were screaming and clawing at me earlier, he grunted as he glanced down the line of his body, frowning at it in disapproval, as though that would somehow ease the effect of her words. Don't try to distract me, Tabor. She was draped halfway across his chest, her breath a warm caress against his skin, stirring senses better left resting for the time being. He had hoped to still this conversation for a while yet. He could pretend male outrage, he figured. It wasn't every day a man was accused of having a problem with that particular portion of his anatomy. But he had a feeling Ronnie wouldn't be fooled. His instincts warned him to step lightly where this subject was concerned, or at least in his deliberate attempts to avoid it. When are you going to go to sleep? He mumbled, ignoring her question as he lay back on his pillow and closed his eyes, determined to sleep himself. You didn't answer me. Her voice was reflective, the very softness of it warning him that soon it would breach the anger point. Her fingers danced over his chest, her nails scraping lightly, the pads of her fingers feeling he knew the tiny hairs that covered his body. Nearly invisible, soft as down, the light pelt was yet another reminder of his DNA. Tabor opened his eyes, staring at the ceiling as he breathed in deeply. How many years had he longed just for one day to forget who and what he was? Yet the knowledge was always there, never far enough away to give him the ease he often prayed for. And now, Ronnie needed answers, which he was more than reluctant to give her just yet. He didn't know if he was ready to face the possible consequences and her horror of learning just how closely he resembled the animal his genetics had been mixed with. I know I didn't answer you, he finally said softly, curving his arm under her body so his fingers could play absently with the long waves of silken golden hair. He loved her hair. It was thick and soft, curling gently around her shoulders and framing her heart-shaped face seductively. He noticed with distant amazement that it was rather comforting to smooth it between his fingers to feel a cool, gentle weight of it. Are you going to? Tabor glanced over as she sat up in the bed, pulling her hair free of his fingers as she tucked the sheet around her until she could shield her full, naked breasts. His lips quirked at her modesty. He knew every inch of her body, yet still she would blush the prettiest pink if he saw her nude while not engaged in their lusty play. The pressing subject of her sudden need for answers weighed on him, though. Answers he had no intention of giving her yet. Let it go, he sighed deeply, moving to rise from the bed. Damn it, he wasn't sleepy. He was fooling himself thinking he could rest now. I need to check security outside. You're avoiding the question now, Tabor. She snapped, her eyes glittering with blue fire as he glanced back at her. She sat on her knees, watching as he moved to the bottom of the bed. He was more than aware that refusing to answer her, rather than feigning ignorance, was a dangerous proposition. He could avoid her questions, but he'd be damned if he would lie in response to them. He had little else to give her but honesty, in those areas where he could answer at all. Guess you're right, he shrugged, trying to appear unconcerned, to hide the aching loneliness that rose in the pit of his soul. She had every right to know the answer, and yet he couldn't bring himself to say the words, to explain to her the animal that found such satisfaction in the tight depths of her rippling pussy. And you think you're just going to walk out of here with no explanation? She asked him, her voice rising with anger and an edge of hurt. Tabor stared back at her, steeling himself against her pain. She needed so much more to hold on to than she was being given, and he knew it. Everything in her life had been stripped away from her in one blow. Her home, her job, a chance to be free and safe, and he couldn't even give her answers. There was no fairness in it, and yet neither could he bring himself to fix it. Let it go, Ronnie. He padded to the bathroom door, intending to pull a change of clothes from the walk-in closet in the other room. As he reached the bathroom door, with no warning whatsoever— the shattering of a crystal bowl from the nightstand had him stopping in disbelief. The dim lights of the room gleamed dully on the crystal shards, mocking him with his belief that she would have allowed him to walk away so easily. If nothing else, his Ronnie could be a tempestuous little spitfire. Had she been feline? 
she would have made a perfect wildcat mix. You leave this room and I'll take your head off with the next one, she snarled. His cock leapt to life. Tabor glanced down at the heavy erection with a sense of resigned amusement. It said a lot about a man who got a hard-on from such an event. It said even less about him that his female's rage could trigger it. Damn. He wanted nothing more than to turn around, go back to that bed, and fuck her silly. His skin itched with the need. In a single second, every cell in his body was screaming for hard, driving sex. He turned back to her watching her broodingly as he crossed his arms over his chest. Her gaze flickered to his erection, and damned if she didn't blush again. That added color only seemed to make him harder. She had moved from the bed. In one hand, she clutched the sheet to her chest, in the other, she held the matching bowl from his nightstand. Evidently, the state of his arousal held no bearing on her determination for answers, it figured. You know, those came with the house, he sighed nodding at the small, decorative item. I imagine they cost quite a bit. Who gives a damn? She was spitting mad now. I'm sick of you running out on me, Tabor. I'll be damned if I'll be tied to you while you waltz on your merry way, avoiding me whenever you feel like it. He watched her in amazement. Emotion, thick and hot, colored her voice while her eyes snapped with fury and stubbornness. Her slender body vibrated with emotion, her frown darkening her brow, thinning her full, luscious lips. She was tempting him to mount her there and then. I have never run out on you, Ronnie. Her words finally sank past his lust-crazed brain, and in the next second, his eyes widened as he jumped out of the way of her next flying missile. Son of a bitch, Ronnie! He sprinted toward her, jerking her back from the heavy candlestick that sat on the table as well. His arms wrapped around her waist, pulling her against him, restraining the violence he could feel shuddering through her body. What the hell's wrong with you? He released her as he tossed her to the bed, but he didn't attempt to follow her. He was tired of this, tired of the fury that filled her, the distrust, the shadows that haunted her eyes. I'm sick to damned hell of you accusing me of leaving you when it was your own decision to break off whatever relationship was beginning. She scrambled across the bed, landing on her feet on the other side. Better, he thought. The further she was from him, the more of his common sense he seemed able to maintain. Oh, come on, Tabor. I never took you for a liar, too, she yelled back, a sneer on her lips. Something else he was tired of, that sneer. Condescending, offending. Stop playing so innocent. You don't have to pretend with me. Not here while we're alone. The only reason I'm here is because of this damned mark you put on my neck. Otherwise, I'd still be sitting in Sandy Hook, wondering why the hell you changed your mind so quickly last year. He stilled, his instincts kicking in as logic began to take over. What couldn't be understood must be examined, studied, stalked, or hunted. And he sure as hell didn't understand this. Why I changed my mind? He asked her carefully his chest tightening at the pain that had been reflected in her voice and her expression. It came much too close to the pain he had felt when he received her letter over a year ago, mere hours after he had placed that mark on her neck. And yet, by her own furious words, she believed he had broken off the relationship, new as it had been himself. Ronnie wasn't a liar. She didn't play games, and she didn't pass the blame on something she was responsible for herself. His body had been a mess that day, he admitted. Arousal unlike anything he had ever known, a hard-on damned near strong enough to split his genes, and here came Diane with... He stopped. Diane. Son of a bitch. He wiped his hand across his face, staring over at her, fighting a betrayal he had prayed had been over with the death of his brother. Diane's determination to destroy the rest of them had nearly killed Marinus and the child she now carried. His death was too well remembered. His betrayal burned too deeply into Tabor's brain to discount his senses. Diane had lied, and Tabor had fallen for it. Don't answer that. He hated the hoarse, tired sound of his own voice as he stalked over to his dresser. He opened the middle drawer pushing back several thick envelopes and a few mementos. In the back, near the corner, was a small wooden box. 
He removed it, flipped it open, and removed the folded square of paper. I'm quitting the garage and you, Tabor. I've realized after that scene in the truck how easily you'll try to take me over. I won't be a puppet for you any longer. You're too blunt, too crude, too rough. I need someone who touches me softly. Someone I don't have to be frightened of. Someone closer to my own age. You'll be old while I'm still young, and I just don't want to deal with it. Please afford me the courtesy of staying the hell away from me. That's surely not too much to ask. Ronnie. He had the letter memorized. He was barely eight years older than she was, but at times it felt like centuries. Read this. He handed her the letter, watching her confused expression closely. Tabor kept his gaze locked with hers as she took the folded square, watching her closer, his soul bleeding. Instinctively, he knew she hadn't written that letter now. Knew that the past fifteen hellish months, needing her, aching for her until he thought he would die from the need, had all been for nothing. She unfolded the letter, her gaze moving to the words. Her eyes widened, her lips trembled. The pain that crossed her expression tore at his soul. I thought I was respecting your wishes, Ronnie, he whispered, feeling wearier now than he had in years. Diane had been a trusted, much-loved member of the family. I will assume you received a letter as well, since I know Diane's only true gift was that of forgery. She crumpled the note in her hand, tears shining in her eyes, spiking her lashes as her gaze returned to his. I didn't write this, she whispered bleakly, trembling. But I received one as well. A fine shudder rippled over her body as she stared back at him. It was your handwriting. She looked at the letter again, her breath hitching as she fought a sob, realizing as Tabor did just how close to her handwriting that letter was. And I didn't write you one either, he said gently. I was fighting desperately to give you time to think, to know what we were about to do was what you wanted. I knew what I was, Ronnie. I knew the danger I was putting you in. I was trying to be certain, beyond all doubt, that I could protect you if somehow my existence was revealed to the Council. As far as they knew, I was long dead. I had all intentions of returning to you. When you didn't show up, I waited. There was so much pain, so much regret in the dark depths of her eyes that he wanted to scream out in rejection of such misery. He had fought for so long to protect her, only to have one he considered his brother deal her the final blow to her confidence. The next morning he brought the letter. He pushed me against the wall with his body. She broke off painfully, swallowing tightly before continuing. He offered to train me for you. Rage ate at his soul and Tabor knew that if Diane wasn't dead, then he would have killed him personally for daring to touch Ronnie in any manner, let alone saying anything so hurtful to her. He remembered well the bright dreams, the need and emotion that sparkled in her eyes when she looked at him all those months ago. That letter and Diane's attack had nearly destroyed a part of her soul. Tabor reached out, unable to keep from touching her, from needing her. God, he needed her like he needed to breathe, or worse. His fingers smoothed over her satiny cheek, his thumb caressing her lips. She had the softest lips he had ever known, and eyes that pierced every corner of his soul with sunlight when she was happy. Yet when she hurt, as she did now, it was like a knife plunging into his chest. I would have given my life to be with you that night, he swore, knowing it was no more than the truth. At the same time, the Council's mercenaries were moving in on Callan, and rather than let that rage loose where you might see it, I let it loose on them instead. I should have come to you. He had known that then. It had taken all he had at the time not to do exactly that. I should have fought for what I knew was mine. A tear slid down her cheek. I loved you, she whispered, breaking his heart with the aching emotion in her voice. I still love you, but I'm not pleased with you, Tabor. His hand dropped as she moved away from him, frowning in surprise. I had no idea you hadn't written that letter, Ronnie, he argued. Oh, not that, she snapped as she tossed the wadded-up ball of paper across the room before casting him a dark look. 
I'm as guilty as you are in letting that bastard trick me. She turned back to him, the anger slowly returning. I haven't forgotten my original question, and don't you think I have? Fine, we were tricked. We'll deal with it. But we have other things to deal with as well. I'll ask you once again. What happens to your cock when you climax? And I want to know now. Thankfully, blessedly, strange as that thought was, the security alarms began to blare. Get dressed. He picked her up quickly, ignoring her gasp of surprise as he strode around the glass by the bathroom door and carried her to the walk-in closet. What the hell is that? She yelled over the din of the sirens, catching the clothing he threw her way as he jerked his own jeans and t-shirt from their hangers. They dressed in seconds, pulling on leather sneakers then rushing from the room. Tabor worriedly eyed the revolver she insisted on carrying. To be honest, he wouldn't blame her or be surprised if she turned it on him, and he knew damned good and well her aim was almost fucking perfect. He had taught her how to shoot himself. Chapter 21 Can't a man even come visit his goddamn daughter without being attacked? She's my kid, I have a right to know if she's alive or not. Ronnie flinched as her father's booming voice echoed up to her, coarse and blustering, causing her to come to an abrupt, dead stop halfway down the stairs that led to the entrance hall. Tabor stopped behind her, still and silent, watching her carefully. She was too tense, almost frightened, wary, like a deer sensing danger but not certain which direction it was coming from. Reginald Andrews was one of the worst fathers Tabor had ever known. His only saving grace, the only reason he still lived, was the fact that he had never laid a hand on Ronnie, Otherwise, Tabor would have killed him years ago. Mr. Andrews, that doesn't explain why you were trying to sneak into the grounds. Why not just press the call button on the gates? Callan's voice was as cold and crisp as a winter night. He was flat furious. Reginald was, as always, making excuses. Loudly. Tabor watched as Ronnie drew in a deep, hard breath. He could almost feel the distaste that filled her and the reluctance that held her still and silent. But he could sense more than that. The morass of emotions that seemed to rush from her overwhelmed him, made him move closer to her, determined to protect her. He laid one hand at her waist, leaning close to her, his chin settling against her shoulder. We could go back to the room. Ignore him. If you don't go down there, Callan will take it as silent permission to have the bastard thrown out. He whispered the words so softly that only she heard him. He kept his body close enough to be certain his warmth and silent security enfolded her. He would protect her, no matter what it took. She swallowed tightly, and he could literally feel her fighting for the strength to face the man raging in the hallway. No. She finally shook her head as she reached back, tucking the revolver he had given her into the waistband of her jeans. I'll deal with him. But she didn't want to. Tabor was getting the distinct impression that there was something about her father that literally terrified her now. Before he could question her about it, she was moving gracefully down the stairs, her hand retaining a light grip on the balustrade, her shoulders straight and erect. As regal as a princess and so determined to be strong it brought a lump to his throat, made him want to shelter her that much more. Why are you here, Reginald? She had to raise her voice to be heard over his furious tirade concerning the welfare of his beloved only child. The sound of it made Tabor sick. Reginald had aged severely in the time since Tabor had last seen him. His dark hair was almost fully gray and thinning. He tried to make up for that fact by growing one side longer than the other and combing it over the opposite side, giving him an off-center, clownish appearance. His brown eyes were dull, his cheeks ruddy from drink and overweight. He was barely six feet tall and not nearly as muscular as he had been even five years before. As Ronnie stepped into the entry hall, all eyes turned to her. The feline breeds filling the marbled entrance to the house were on alert, their hands on their weapons, their eyes sharp and missing not a move that the older man made. Ronnie. Reginald's smile was more calculating than loving. Callan had noticed it as well, if the narrow-eyed look of dislike was anything to go by. Tabor watched him closely, 
seeing the flash of hatred the other man tried to hide as he glanced at his daughter. Tabor moved quickly then to insinuate himself between Reginald and Ronnie, every instinct inside him screaming out that he protect her from whatever threat her father represented. Ronnie stopped as he stepped in front of her, confronting her father rather than allowing her to. Tabor. She laid her hand on his arm as he pressed it back, stilling her attempt to move in front of him. At his movement, the others stepped into protective positions as well, their eyes narrowing on Reginald, hands now gripping their weapons in preparation. Why are you here, Reggie? Tabor didn't bother with the formalities. Ronnie was upset, his own instincts were kicking into overdrive, and he would be damned if he would allow it to continue. Well, she's my daughter. Reginald's voice softened, but he couldn't hide the stench of his own lies. He wasn't there to assure himself of Ronnie's safety, which made him an immediate threat to her. Find time to remember that, Tabor growled, making certain to show the canines that he knew would gleam menacingly at the sides of his mouth. He was pleased to see a bit of the ruddy color dim in the other man's face as he paled at the sight. I don't remember it bothering you over much before. I can handle Reginald Tabor. Ronnie pushed at his heavy body, attempting to get him to move aside. There was no going around him as the other breeds had aligned themselves in a way that would keep her clearly out of the other man's reach. Tabor, you should at least let me see my little girl. Reginald's voice was too soft, too intentionally non-threatening for Tabor's peace of mind. Tabor, damn it, I can handle this. Ronnie kicked his shin, and it sure as hell wasn't a love pat. The damned woman had dangerous feet. He turned back to look at her warningly. Don't you give me that look, she snapped, frowning back at him in determination. Get out of my way so I can deal with this, then you can send him packing. She was going to kick him again, and he knew it. He could see it in her eyes. Damn, he loved it when she got physical with him. He smiled at her, a slow baring of his teeth, a sexual reminder of retaliation. He was pleased to see the slight widening of her eyes, the ripple of response that was barely detectable, the scent of sweet, clean arousal that suddenly bloomed from her body. He stepped back slowly, his arm going behind her, his hand clasping her hip to be sure she stayed close and well out of reach of the threat he was sensing. Humph. I can see you're getting along fine. Reginald couldn't hide the small telltale hint of vindictive displeasure in his voice. The insult that had Tabor flexing his muscles in preparation to take the bastard apart, limb by limb. Broke already? she asked him softly. Her voice was smooth and mocking but Tabor sensed the anger he could feel building inside her. Reginald grunted. They burned the house. Your mom's pictures, the quilts, everything's gone. Ronnie flinched noticeably. Tabor speared the man with a look that promised retribution, a rumbling growl of warning sounding from his chest. He was deliberately hurting her now, choosing his words carefully, striking where she was most tender. Reginald eyed him warily. You used to be nicer than this, Tabor, he sighed as though the reception he was receiving disappointed him. And you used to be smarter than this, Reggie, Tabor retorted softly, barely restraining his violence. If only he could figure out why the other man was sending his instincts off the scales, then he would feel more comfortable. You've seen her. She's fine. You can leave now. Ronnie, you gonna let them throw me out? Reginald turned to his daughter the whine in his voice grating on Tabor's ears. Things are real tough right now, with our pictures flashing all over the television screens and your association with this... Reginald paused insultingly. Man being reported all over the world? I can't even get a decent job from the old sources anymore. The old sources, no doubt, being illegal. You should have spent your last payment more wisely, Reginald. She tried to sound unfeeling, cool under pressure, but Tabor could hear the pain in her voice. This isn't my home. Mine burned to the ground, remember? I have no right to determine who stays and who goes. Reginald cast Callan a calculating look. You gonna throw her daddy out on the street? You know how much trouble this has caused me, Callan. Callan watched Ronnie as closely as Tabor did. You have family. 
Ronnie reminded her father almost desperately. I'll give you the money, Reginald. She stopped. Tabor could hear her breathing in harshly. I don't have my purse, but I'll call the bank. I'll get you the money. No, Ronnie, honey. You know none of those brothers of mine are going to let me bed down in their fancy-assed houses. You know how they always turn their backs on us. It was no less than the truth. Just as it was no less than Reginald's own fault that his family had literally disowned him. The house is full at present, Reginald. Callan finally stepped forward. We can put you up at the barracks on the other side of the house grounds. There are a few empty bunks there. Reginald's gaze never left Ronnie's. He stared at her the way a snake did an intended meal. Cold, deliberate, unflinching. That's rat-friendly of you, Callan, he finally said softly. Tabor felt a chill chase down his back as Ronnie stilled a flinch. She was frightened. He could feel it, almost smell it radiating from her body. She tensed, holding herself rigidly erect as she stared back at her father. Don't make trouble here, Reginald, she finally warned him, her voice low, resonating with throttled anger. I won't be held responsible for what they do to you if you try to. Tabor looked down at her, holding back his surprise. He had never heard Ronnie threaten anyone other than him, personally, and certainly never her wayward, mercenary father. Why, Ronnie, shame on you making these good people think I'd cause trouble. He hadn't even blinked as he stared at her. You know I'm a right social person. They won't have a peep of trouble out of me. Tabor tensed at the veiled threat directed at Ronnie. It pulsed in the air around them and caused the fine hairs on the back of Tabor's neck to lift and bristle in response. Tabor wanted to order the son of a bitch off the estate, cast him out into the streets, and tell him to fend for himself. For as long as Ronnie had been old enough to hold down a part-time job, the bastard had leached every penny she could make. There had been no protecting her from him then, but by God, he could do it now. Escort Mr. Andrews to the workers' bunk shed, Merck, Callan ordered one of the burly guards. Mercury was six and a half feet of muscle with a face so closely resembling that of a cat's that there was no way the man could walk down a public street without inciting riotous panic among the citizens now. He was stern, cold, a killing machine, and one of the most loyal, honorable men Tabor had ever known. He can have the bunk nearest mine. Thin lips spread into a cold smile as eerie amber eyes glittered with cold knowledge. Merck wasn't a fool. We need to talk soon, Ronnie. Reginald smiled thinly as Merck gripped his arm firmly. Catch up on things, you know? I think we said enough last week, Reginald. She answered him firmly, her voice cold enough to chill an iceberg. Enjoy your stay, but I doubt I'll have time to visit. You might want to make time. Reginald tried to pull his arm back from the soldier escorting him from the house. Think about it, Ronnie. Think hard. The door closed on his parting words. Tabor continued to watch his mate closely, his mind working, turning over possibilities and threats, and only coming up with more answers. You want to explain that little meeting to me, Ronnie? He asked her softly, aware that all eyes had turned to them. Her gaze lifted to his slowly, but not slow enough for him to miss the flash of fear that she fought to hide. Sure, Tabor. He didn't like that slow, tight smile that crossed her lips. I'll be more than happy to the very minute you answer my earlier question. Turn about, baby. She nudged his waist with her elbow in a deliberately forced, playful mood. You just let me know when you're ready to talk. She turned then, moving quickly for the stairs again and taking them with quick, almost running steps. She was fighting to escape, to hide, just as she had always done when she was younger and rushed into the night with only her senses to guide her. More often than not, Tabor found her lost and frightened each time. He wondered what he would find when he followed her this time. Tabor, we might have a problem. Callan stepped closer, pulling a small, ultra-sensitive receiver from the pocket of his slacks. I picked this up from the office when Merck informed me who he had. The receiver was a handy little bug locator given to them by the U.S. military. Good old Reginald was wired for sound to hell and back. Our only problem now is figuring out who hired him.
Chapter 22 The best way to figure out what he's up to is to keep him from Ronnie as long as possible, Tabor told the men assembled in the large office downstairs early the next morning. Callan, Tanner, Merck, Kane, and several of his brothers were watching him quietly. You knew him better than we did, Callan shrugged. What do you think he's up to? Tabor grunted. Reginald is low-level sleaze. He doesn't have the brains to mastermind anything but a good drunk and some petty theft, so I'm going to assume it's one of two things. He wants to weasel money out of us, or someone has him on a chain. He doesn't do too badly when he has instructions, but he doesn't improvise well. Tabor frowned as he considered the scrapes he knew Reginald had been in throughout the past decade. He had been his most wily, his most dangerous, when working for others. It would be my guess he's on a chain then. Kane spoke up. I pulled his record last night after Merck took him to the barracks. After that, I pulled in some favors and got a little added info from my own sources. Mr. Andrews has worked with some very heavy hitters in the past. Men who wouldn't care a bit to use him to gain access to his daughter. If they got hold of her, I doubt it would be pretty. They were all aware of the fact that the council was now desperate to learn the importance of the mark Marinus carried on her shoulder— and the significance of the tests they had managed to attain from the scientists who had examined the breeds after their surprising announcement to the world three months before. The hormonal changes that had shown in her blood work and other tests had thrown the scientists into a tailspin. The discovery that she could conceive, despite the small amount of human sperm Callan's body normally produced, had shocked them further. The truth their own doctor had found would have astounded them even more. It wasn't the sperm contained in the ejaculation of his cock that was so potent. It was the sperm contained in the small, thumb-like barb that only became engorged during sex with Marinus that allowed the conception. For some reason, he must think he can gain her cooperation. Merck sat stiffly in his chair, and Tabor could sense his impatience, his discomfort. Merck had been trained in almost complete isolation. There had been no pride to sustain him, no friends— no confidants in the lab he had been found in. Being closed up in the office with the other men wasn't easy for him. What makes you say that? Tabor asked him carefully. It was no more than he had sensed himself the night before. The man is pretty impatient to get to her, keeps demanding to see his little girl. The breed sneered the last two words. He's not her father, by the way. Tabor stared at him in surprise. He told you this? He didn't have to tell me, he snorted. You can smell it if you take the time to try. There's no relationship there. Scents are all off. Tabor looked at Callan. His leader hadn't mentioned this ability the newest member of their pride had. Callan only lifted his shoulders in reply and gave a short shake of his head. Evidently, he hadn't known either. How are the scents off? Tabor asked, watching him curiously. The other man leaned forward in his chair, a frown crossing his lion-like face. Anyone born of the same blood shares a unique, scented bond with their most immediate family. You just have to be able to detect and separate the varied smells to understand it. Reginald Andrews does not share this with the woman he claims as his daughter. He is no relation to her. It made sense. Suddenly, more pieces of Ronnie's life were beginning to come together. So he's no relation, which means there's not a chance in hell of any bond keeping him from harming her, Kane pointed out. Tabor snorted. There never was. Reginald would sell his own mother to slavers if it would bring him enough money. His only bond is the one he has with his wallet and the bottom of a liquor bottle. He rose from his chair, pacing along the room. He was aware of Callan's gaze following him and the concern from the other members of the meeting. How is your relationship with her working out? Callan asked. Tabor shook his head. He wasn't about to discuss that with any of them. Hell, he wasn't sure he understood it himself. She didn't seem too pleased with him last night, Tanner chuckled. Sounds like he's holding out on her. Let me guess, you didn't tell her about the little buddy your cock has. Tabor shot his younger brother a withering glance. Tanner wiped the smile quickly off his face, but it lingered along the edges of his lips. Kane chuckled. The damned man was working quickly at getting on his bad side. He was finding too much amusement in this situation. 
Whoever has a leash on Andrews wouldn't be far away, Callan spoke up, bringing the conversation back on track. They would have to be somewhere close. And he'll have to make contact pretty often without the little bugs that shirt of his carried. Merck's voice was hard, lethal. Those buttons were state of the art. Let me tell you. Too bad it got thrown in the wash. Guess he shouldn't have left such expensive material laying around. Yeah, shit like that happens. Tabor smiled coldly. He would have liked to see Reginald's reaction to that one. Keep a close eye on him. I want to report on everyone he talks to on and off the estate grounds. Let's see if we can't figure out who his handlers are. I have some men on it, Kane spoke up. One of them we can possibly use to get close to him. Sometimes my men can come off as real cat haters. Tabor sighed deeply. There were times a few of Kane's men could have convinced him of it. Then we just sit back and wait, he sighed. Waiting had never been difficult for him before. He was considered one of the most patient of the three males that made up his original pride. But he'd be damned if that patience wasn't wearing thin now. Wait and see how far we can push him, Kane shrugged as he came to his feet. We have some contractors coming to the estate today to finish up that fence around the grounds. Keep the women in the house and the curtains closed until they're gone. I don't want to take any chances with them. I'll post guards at all the entrances to be certain no one slips in. Other than that, it's business as usual. Business as usual was becoming a fight to stay alive. What about our little gun-toting friend? Tabor asked him, wondering about the assassin they were still holding. Has he talked yet? Not yet, Kane shrugged. Pretty soon it won't matter. We're running background checks on him now and should have answers soon. When the report comes in, I'll know every dirty little secret he ever thought he could have hidden. He won't be a problem for long. If Tabor or Callan got their hands on him, he wouldn't be alive long either. Okay, everyone knows their jobs today. Callan was interrupted when the door to the office was rudely jerked open. Tabor turned in surprise to see Ronnie standing there, a short little sundress gracing her slender body, a frown etched on her brow as her eyes blazed furiously. That dress was going to drive him insane, Tabor thought. The soft cream color was a perfect foil for her skin, bringing out the blue in her eyes, the flush on her cheeks. He wanted to jerk it to her hips and take her there in the doorway, pounding into her pussy until she screamed out her pleasure. Look at it this way, Kane muttered behind him. At least you have a reason for being pussy-whipped. No need to be ashamed. Tabor eyed him in irritation. You know, Kane, when Shara finally decides to show you what you keep daring her to, I'm going to enjoy giving you back every smart-ass remark you've ever made. Count on that. Meow, Kane chuckled. Good luck, Garfield. Catch you round. Ronnie, Tabor questioned her when she didn't move from the doorway. Is everything okay? It wasn't. He could smell the desperate heat coming off her body, but mixed with that, he could sense the pain she was fighting so hard to tamp down. She glanced at the other men. I'll come back. I didn't know you were busy. That's okay. He shook his head in response. We're pretty much finished up here. He moved to her, amazed at the sensitivity of his own flesh as he neared her, as though the part of him longed for nothing more than her touch. It was a strange feeling for a man who had never known such a weakness before. He watched the way she glanced at the others uncomfortably, her gaze flickering to them before lowering. A light blush stained her cheeks, and the soft color only added to the beauty that never failed to amaze him. What's wrong? He nuzzled her cheek gently as his hand cupped her hip, moving her against him just enough to feel the warmth of her body. You know what's wrong. Her voice was tight, tense with the heat he knew traveled through her body, through his own. And don't think for one minute I'm pleased about it. Now let me talk to Reginald so we can get him the hell out of here. Tell your guard dogs to back down. Cats, Miss Andrews, Kane laughed. Wrong species. Various snarls greeted his words, not the least of which was Tabor's. He was running out of patience with this loosely related brother-in-law. No. He finally turned back to her, regretting the anger that flared in her eyes. Not yet, Ronnie. Not until I know how dangerous he is. 
I won't allow you to see him. He watched the fire that snapped in her eyes, his cock thickening in arousal as he felt her preparing to defy him. Won't allow me? She snapped furiously. You won't allow me? Since when, Tabor Williams, do you have the right to allow me anything? He smiled tightly, tamping down the need to show her rather than tell her exactly what gave him that right. She was tempting him, daring him, pitting her stubbornness against his own, and he was about to inform her who would win, in no uncertain terms. When I took you to the floor and mounted you, I took the right to protect you as well, he informed her coolly. Mate. Chapter 23 The office cleared out rather quickly after Tabor's words seemed to echo around the room. His voice pulsed with ire, with lust, setting her nerves on edge, causing the blood to thunder through her veins. She couldn't figure out how he managed to do it. It had to be that damned hormone he kept infecting her with. To say his kiss was addicting would be an understatement in his case. You have no right to tell me what to do or how to handle my own father, she snapped, slamming the door behind her. And you sure as hell don't own me just because you managed to infect me. Infect you? he snarled. God damn it, Ronnie, it's not a disease. Bet me, she dared him recklessly, her anger and her lust merging. It's painful, Tabor, and I don't like the reaction it produces. The lie nearly seared her lips on its way out. There was nothing she liked more than the results of the searing heat they shared. And I sure as hell don't like this possessive attitude you seem to want to take. Too bad. He crossed his arms over his chest as he stared back at her furiously. Guess you're just going to have to live with it, aren't you? Her eyes narrowed dangerously, her lips thinning with rising anger. Now, if she could just get her breasts to stop swelling and her vagina to dry up, maybe she could really blast into him. It was hard to be pissed when all she wanted was to be fucked. Tabor, I'm about to lose my patience with you, she sighed roughly, pushing her fingers through her hair, hating the sensual feel of it sliding along the bare skin of her upper back. She knew better than to let Marinus talk her into wearing this damned dress. Why? he laughed in surprise. For God's sake, Ronnie, all I'm trying to do is protect you, not lock you up. As soon as we figure out what the hell he's up to, I'll let you run him off personally. She gave him a resentful look. No, you wouldn't. It might be too dangerous. She drew the last word out mockingly. Tabor sighed. The sound of it pricked at her conscience. Is it so bad, Ronnie, to need to protect you? He asked her softly, watching her with a heated, lust-filled gaze. Her eyes flickered to his hips then back to his face. She ignored the glimmer of amusement she saw there. His cock filled out the front of those jeans in a way that sent her pulse hammering and silky heat sliding from her vagina. In a way, it is, she finally answered him as she moved closer, drawn to him, her body demanding his touch. I don't like it, Tabor, not having a choice. She saw his grimace as her hands touched his chest, his larger, calloused hands covered hers, his eyes closing briefly before he opened them, allowing her to see the haunted depths of his own fears. I know this isn't easy for you. His whisper stroked over her nerve endings like sensuous silk. She allowed her fingers to stroke him in a similar manner. She loved the look on his face when she caressed him, touched him as a lover. His eyes became heavy-lidded, his lips a bit fuller, his high cheekbones flushing darkly. Being horny makes me cranky, Tabor. She leaned against him, cushioning the hard ridge of his cock against her lower stomach. It makes me want to take a bite out of someone. She leaned forward, her mouth opening over his flat nipple as she allowed her teeth to sink into the muscle there. His groans shattered the silence of the room as his hands moved to her hips, holding her against him with almost bruising strength. Go ahead and bite me all you want to. He was nearly panting when her tongue peeked out to rub against the hard little nub beneath it. Damn, Ronnie, God, yes. She felt the material of the dress inching up her thighs, 
pulled by Tabor's gripping fingers as she rubbed against his chest. She could feel the heat of his flesh radiating through the soft cotton shirt he wore, the building lust that simmered just under the skin. I need you, she whispered as she lifted her head from his chest and licked her lips nervously. Now. An involuntary moan escaped her throat as his hand cupped the bare globes of her rear, clenching the firm muscle, lifting her closer to the cradle of his thighs. Her fingers moved to his shirt as desperation speared through her like wild lightning. She didn't take time to unbutton the material. Her fingers gripped the parted edge and pulled, ripping buttons free, tearing cloth as he growled in sexy approval. Whenever you want it, baby, he whispered. However you want it. He pushed the material of her dress to her waist before his fingers hooked in the waistband of her thong, tearing it casually from her body. There was now no barrier between his touch and her flesh as his fingers slid between her thighs. She was so wet, so slick from the juices seeping from her pussy that his fingers slid easily along her cunt lips. He circled her clit slowly as his arm tightened around her waist, holding her still for the erotic manipulations. She was drowning in heat, in sexual desperation. Ronnie couldn't still the twisting of her hips as she fought to get closer to the tormenting fingers driving her insane. Her mouth opened on a soundless moan of exquisite desire, only to have his lips cover hers, his tongue plunging in demandingly, twining with hers, silently demanding she take what he offered. Her lips closed on the intruder with a desperation that she knew should have horrified her. The sweet, honeyed essence of the unique mating hormone surged through her system. She could feel it. The taste of him filled her first. Then, within seconds, she could feel her blood heating, burning through her veins, surging to her nipples, her sensitive cunt. Good girl, he whispered thickly as he drew back from her long moments later, staring down at her, his gaze hot, as two fingers spread her inner lips before plunging inside the gripping depths of her pussy. Ronnie rose to her tiptoes as a harsh exclamation of near-orgasmic pleasure rushed past her lips. His fingers thrust ruthlessly inside her once again, spreading her apart, working in and out with a fierce, controlled rhythm that had her pussy gushing. Tabor! Her fingers struggled with his belt, desperate now to release the hard wedge of his erection from the confining material of his jeans. She needed him with a hunger she couldn't control, one she didn't want to control. Hard and fast, slamming into her pussy, driving her to the edge of madness and beyond. I can't wait to sink into this tight little pussy, he whispered, his voice guttural, vibrating with the animalistic growl that never failed to make her cunt clench. It did so now, causing him to groan against her lips as he licked them hungrily. Come for me, baby. Let me feel you come on my fingers. His voice stroked over her senses. His fingers fucked into the tormented depths of her gripping cunt, driving her insane with the whiplash of pleasure that tore through her body. Ronnie was gasping for breath as she felt the heated coil in her womb tightening with spasmodic intensity. She fought for breath as his fingers took her ruthlessly, driving deep, stroking nerve endings that were throbbing in desperation from each plunging thrust. Tabor, I can't stand it! She was drawn tight. Hips thrust forward, gyrating on his fingers as he pushed her closer to the brink. Take it. He held her tighter, his fingers working inside her tormented pussy, his thumbs stroking the swollen bud of her clit. Come for me, baby. Let me feel your pussy explode, Ronnie. The sounds of hot, wet sex filled the room. The plunge of his fingers slapping inside her, her moans tearing through her chest, his explicit, exciting words pushing her over the edge as nothing else could have. Her back arched as she felt the end rushing for her. Fingers of electricity danced over her skin, struck her womb, seared her cunt until it came together in a flash of blinding, rapturous sensation. She felt her entire body explode, her pussy tightening until he was groaning with the effort to continue thrusting inside her.
Her release poured through her, convulsing her body as she drove herself repeatedly on the hard digits invading her. Hell yeah, he moaned, holding her close as she shook against him. There, baby, so good, so good, come on my fingers like a good girl, baby. Ronnie felt the tears on her cheeks as she trembled in his arms, the wicked forks of sensation flaying her body in repeated aftershocks as she felt him move her. Her buttocks met the cool wood of the desk as a small measure of sanity began to return to her. She was weak, shaking with a release she couldn't have anticipated, couldn't steel herself against. Her gaze was heavy-lidded, her mind sluggish, until he spread her thighs wide and gazed down between them with hot, greedy eyes. I want that sweet pussy so badly I can't think straight, he growled as he worked at his belt and the metal buttons of his jeans. All that matters is pushing my cock so deep and hard inside you that we both scream with the pleasure. Chapter 24 Tabor was burning with a fever of lust so deep, so strong, he felt as though every cell in his body was going to explode with the need. His fingers shook like a youth's as he unbuttoned the small pearl closures on her dress, spreading the edges apart, revealing the full, tempting globes of her aroused breasts. He didn't know what to do first, latch onto one of those spiked nipples like a starving man and fuck her until they were both dying of it, or eat the thick cream that lay tempting and sweet on the swollen lips of her pussy. He licked his lips, staring up at her as his cock throbbed its insistent demand to plunge inside the little slitted opening of her cunt. His mouth watered for the taste of her. Play with your clit. He held her legs up, spreading her, staring down at her with a building need he didn't know how to answer. She whimpered, a low, desperate sound that had his cock jerking in response. Play with it, baby, he crooned gently, watching as her trembling fingers slid down the soft roundness of her stomach. There you go. Feel how wet and hot you are. It was the most exciting thing he had ever seen in his life. Her fingers, slender and graceful, moving to the soft, soaked fleece that surrounded the swollen bud of her clit, parting the swollen lips, circling the hard little nub. Oh yeah, sweetheart, he encouraged her, almost panting from excitement. Slide your fingers down, Ronnie. I want to see you fuck yourself. See you part that pretty cunt with your own fingers. She was whimpering, flushed, her soft blue eyes dazed with lust as her hips jerked. Oh, that's a good girl. His hands tightened on her thighs as he watched her fingers slide down the narrow cleft, two of the slender digits sliding to the first knuckle inside the tempting depths of her cunt. Feel how hot that sweet pussy is. He could barely force the words from his mouth. I'm going to fuck it so hard and so long, you'll never forget what it's like to have my cock owning you. Her hand jerked, a cry tearing from her chest as more of her juices coated her fingers. His cock was an agonizing throb now. Propping her small feet on the edge of the desk, he used one hand to spread her pussy apart, the other to grip his cock, to ease the mindless rush to shove it so far inside her that he merged with her very soul. I'm dying. Her cry echoed with a touch of fear, thickened with lust, emotion, and desperation. Her fingers sank into her vagina again, pulled back, thrust in as her hips lifted from the desk in response. Yeah, baby, he groaned. Get your fingers nice and slick with that sweet pussy juice, because you're going to feed it to me. Allow me to suck it from your pretty fingers while I fuck you crazy. She came. He watched it, the way her clit swelled further, pulsed and glistened, the flesh stretching around her fingers clenched, spasmed, as her desperate mule of release whispered past her lips. Tabor could wait no longer. He gripped her wrist, pulling her fingers free, grimacing in painful pleasure at the sound of her tight cunt sucking at her departing fingers. Pressing closer, he tucked the head of his cock at the little opening as his eyes met hers, he brought her fingers to his lips, dripping with the swirls of her rich cream, 
and sucked one into his mouth as he plunged his cock deep inside her pussy. Oh, hell. His back arched. The tight, gripping muscles of her sex sucked him in, closing on his erection like a silken vice, milking it rhythmically. Sweet Ronnie. He groaned around her fingers. That's a good girl. Oh, yeah, good, baby. Milk my cock. Her cries were constant now, mewling little sounds, the whisper of his name, the erotic plea that he fuck her hard, deep. But he wanted to stay just like this, his cock spreading her, the lips of her pussy nearly flattened from the width of flesh shoved inside her. So pretty. He licked her fingers of the last drop of erotic cream before laying her hand to the desk, pressing it there firmly, a silent demand that she not move it. She stared back at him, her eyes wide, her lips moist as she tried to breathe past the excitement building in the air around them. His gaze dropped back down to her thighs, a primal rumble of conquest escaping his chest. My pussy. He pulled back then, watching his cock slide nearly free of her, glistening with the slick inner juices that flowed from her. My pretty, hot pussy. He worked the desperately hard shaft back inside her, loving the fierce grip, fighting his orgasm with every breath so he could relish the nearly painful clenching of her muscles on his flesh. His balls had contracted tight and hard beneath his erection, pulsing with the need to release their hot load of sperm into the silky depths of her cunt. His body was raging. Sharp talons of sensation streaked up his spine as he pulled free of her again, only to re-enter her slowly, groaning at the sheer pleasure of watching his cock fuck into her, feeling her grip him, her pussy weep for him. Ah, oh, baby, so good. She tightened on him again as the head of his cock sank to the entrance of her womb, pulled back, stroked in. That's my sweet baby, so tight and hot around my cock. God, I love fucking you, Ronnie. But he couldn't fight the need, clenching every cell in his body much longer. Her sex was an inferno around the thick flesh fucking into her, tightening on him with every thrust as her keening pleas rocked his mind. He was unable to stop the building speed of each penetration, his mind consumed by the sheer exhilaration of burying his cock inside her, feeling the tender flesh glove him, tighten on him. His release was only seconds away. He could feel the barb beneath the head of his cock beginning to lengthen, to prepare to lock him inside her, to release its silky semen along with the load ready to erupt from the head of his cock. Baby! He moved inside her hard and deep now, the moist sounds of his cock penetrating and her cunt suckling, filling the air. He couldn't plunge into her fast enough, hard enough, couldn't get enough of the feel of her pussy tightening on him, tighter, tighter. Fuck yes, yes! He gripped her thighs harder as he felt her vagina quake, ripple, then lock down on him with a force that had him roaring in pleasure as she unraveled beneath him. He couldn't hold off any longer. He threw his head back, sweat dripping from his hair, his face, as he lost his hold on reality. The barb extended its full length, locking him inside her as it pressed firmly into the back of her pussy, holding him in as it released its own precious load into her fertile body. The sensitive extension prolonged the exquisite agony of his release, making his body tremble, convulse, as another roar tore through him. The animal was triumphant, the man awed by the sheer power of emotion that poured from him. His. His woman. His pussy. All his. Chapter 25 Tabor, we have movement outside the house. I'm sending Dawn and Shara to protect Marinus and Ronnie in their rooms but I need you out here. The call came in after midnight, mere hours after Tabor and Ronnie managed to fall into an exhausted sleep. He had carried her back to their room after the exhausting release in the office. Just to sleep, he had assured himself. They hadn't left the room except to eat the rest of the day. The drowsiness fled his brain at Kane's abrupt announcement. I'm on my way, he said quietly as he moved from the bed. 
How close are they? Too fucking close. I have men securing the outside of the house. You and Callan take care of the inside. There are still too many holes we haven't managed to plug yet. I'll keep you updated. Fuck. Tabor cursed as he jerked his jeans from the floor and rushed for the weapons he kept in the large walk-in closet in the bathroom. Ronnie was only steps behind him. This is turning into a bad habit, she muttered as she pulled on a pair of sweatpants and a loose t-shirt he threw her. Marinus was going to run out of clothes soon if she didn't manage to get her own. Stay in the room. Dawn will be up here in a minute to stay with you, he ordered her softly. Keep the curtains closed and stay away from the balcony doors. You'll be safe here. I don't want a chance moving you through the house right now. Dawn knows what she's doing, baby. Just scream if you need me. He handed her the pistol he had taken from her the night before and extra clips before jerking the automatic rifle from the gun rack mounted on the wall. I shoot first and scream later, remember? She pulled her sneakers on and laced them quickly before following him into the room. He moved carefully, his body tense, poised for action. Ronnie didn't speak just followed his lead as he moved through the bedroom, paused at the door that led to the sitting room, and stared into it intently. You'll be safe here. He turned, his lips pressing into hers for a hard, quick kiss before he moved for the door. Lock the door behind me and don't let anyone in, Ronnie. No one but me, do you understand? She gazed up at him intently. I understand. No one but you. Good girl. His voice was seductively approving. She frowned at her own reaction to it. Lock the door now. He opened it slowly, moving with a smooth, graceful slide of his body that drove home the fact that he had lived his entire life enmeshed in danger. He was so used to it that he unconsciously moved with care, no matter where he was or what he was doing. He slipped through the door, then held it open as the small, silent figure of his sister entered the room. Glancing at her one last time, Tabor closed the panel gently behind him. Ronnie turned the lock quickly, then slid the steel deadbolt into place. They locked their bedrooms here tighter than some people did their homes. She laid her head against the thick panel of wood and fought her tears at the thought. She couldn't hear anything or anyone outside the door. She knew the heavy carpeting would have muffled most things, but she also knew the number of men who slept in the house just for safety's sake. The Breeds weren't taking any chances with their leader's wife and the mother of the Pride's first child. All precautions were taken to protect Marinus and Ronnie from any threat. He'll be fine. Don Daniel's voice was a soft, gentle sound, almost purring as she spoke behind Ronnie. Ronnie drew in a deep breath, pushing herself away from the door as she turned to face the other woman. Tabor had told her that Don was a cougar breed, her DNA mixed with that of the reclusive, graceful mountain cats. She looked like she should have been from a tabby cat, though. She was slender, almost fragile, several inches shorter than Ronnie, and despite the fact that she was at least several years older than Ronnie, she looked like a teenager. A very young teenager. Until you saw the automatic rifle slung across her shoulder that she carried like an extension of herself, or looked into her haunted eyes. Dawn shifted uncomfortably as Ronnie gazed at her through the dim light that barely filtered from the other room. Shoulder-length, thick, tawny brown hair barely brushed the other girl's shoulders as it framed a small, heart-shaped face. Thank you for staying with me, Ronnie said softly, moving to the couch, trying to still the nervous shaking of her hands. She laid the gun on the cushion beside her as she curled up in the corner, watching the other woman. Dawn followed suit though she took the chair opposite her, propping the rifle against her knee as she watched Ronnie with shy curiosity. Tabor's one of our best fighters, she said in that soft, melodic voice. He won't let anyone get up here, and if they did, I wouldn't let them pass the door. A thread of steel ran beneath the last statement. There was barely enough light to see by, but Ronnie glimpsed the flash of rage in her eyes. Ronnie hadn't had a chance to really talk to Dawn, or any of the other family members she had known in Sandy Hook. Not that anyone could really have claimed to know Dawn. She was rarely seen in the small town, and when she was, she rarely talked. There was something too silent, too heartbreaking in the quiet features of her face, as though she carried a cloak of nightmares about her at all times. The estate here is gorgeous, 
Ronnie finally said, desperate to keep the other woman talking. She needed to concentrate on something other than the possible dangers Tabor would face outside. How did you find it? A mocking little smile played about the lush fullness of Dawn's lips. The estate was given to us, actually, along with a nice little lump sum of money to help aid the other breeds being found in various locations. Several of the council members were high-ranking heads of our government. Her voice sang with an earthy, haunting quality. How many are there so far? Ronnie asked her curiously. So far, we have nearly a hundred feline breeds on site, working to secure our place in society in Washington. More come in monthly. Her voice trailed off, as though the thought of those coming in struck a chord of resounding pain within her soul. I'm sorry. Ronnie didn't know what to say. A gentle smile crossed Dawn's lips, filled her expression. Don't be sorry, Ronnie. We are alive, and isn't that what matters? It was obvious that Dawn asked herself that question often. What was it about her? Ronnie had never understood the quiet aura that always surrounded the other woman. She had seen the men of the county when they were around her. Rough, hard-edged men suddenly softened, their smiles gentling. Men who would have made lewd advances to any woman as beautiful as Dawn had cast their eyes to the floor, shame marking their expressions. Her looks weren't so unusually striking as to stop traffic. She was slender, delicate, with thick silken hair and large brown eyes that always seemed so haunted. And perhaps that was it, Ronnie thought. Her eyes seemed to tell a tale that Dawn never whispered. Everyone looks at me like that. Dawn shook her head in apparent confusion as Ronnie watched her. Ronnie sighed deeply. I'm sorry, you seem... So sad. I guess before I never realized why. And you do now? There was no insult intended in her voice, just a weary acceptance. I don't think so. Ronnie shook her head slowly. I think it's more than the situation, more than your entrance into society. How old are you when Callan brought you out of the labs? And there was the answer. Her eyes flashed. Nightmare, memory, and terror. I was fifteen. Shara was eighteen. That was more than ten years ago. It seems only yesterday sometimes. She shook her head, a weary smile crossing her face. They made us tell them about the labs during the Senate hearings and the closed trials of some of the council members. Shara cried. Her voice dropped. Like she did in the labs, before Callan took us out. She has never cried like that since our escape. Callan picked her up out of the witness stand and carried her out of the proceedings. It was weeks before she could awaken without screaming. What about you? Ronnie asked her, gently. Dawn shook her head, lowering it before giving her a soft, broken smile. I just don't sleep, Ronnie. Not for long and not very deeply. What's the point when the monsters can take you again and again and again? She shuddered and came to her feet, her head tilting, her eyes suddenly narrowing as the gun fell naturally into her grasp. What? Shh! Dawn hissed softly. Listen. She heard it then. A scratch, a scrape at the balcony doors. Her eyes widened in horror as she grabbed the pistol, moving along the wall, careful to stay as far to the side of the glass doors as possible. Dawn moved like a shadow then. She jerked the comm link down from its position on the back of her head, adjusting the mic as she listened intently. The scratching came again, followed by a careful shuffle of the doors. Alpha One, we have a breach. Dawn's voice was so soft Ronnie barely heard it as the other woman moved to her, covering her as she motioned to the bedroom. Keeping her weapon at her shoulder, Ronnie moved quietly around the room, her breath nearly strangling her as she fought to keep the fear to a manageable level. She got as far as the bedroom door and stopped. The slow slide of the balcony door had her eyes flying to Dawn in alarm. Fuck, get up here! Dawn's voice was soft as she spoke into the comm link, carrying no further than Ronnie as the other woman motioned to her and they headed quickly to the bedroom door. We're evac! We're evac! She slid the locks free, opening the door as she checked outside quickly before moving from the room. Ronnie followed quickly, 
her finger caressing the trigger of the gun as she held it ready, checking behind them often, fighting to hear about the pounding of her heart. The hallway was dark, silent, as they moved quickly along the corridor. We're heading to Marinus's room, Tabor. Get up here. They're on our asses now. Dawn opened another door and they moved through it as a sudden curse echoed from the open door of Ronnie and Tabor's room. Dawn locked the door with a silent movement and turned back to the room. Marinus and Shara were waiting, both armed, both watching the darkness from the side of the balcony doors that room held as well. But Marinus and Callan's room wasn't a suite. It was one large bedroom and completely open except for the attached bathroom. They're moving toward us, Shara hissed into her own mic as she and Marinus moved into the center of the room. They know the location of the bedrooms, and we're sitting ducks. God damn it, Kane, get me some help up here. Tabor and Callan are on their way, Don reported as they all moved quickly for the only shelter left to them. The bathroom was as large as Tabor's, but still, it afforded few places that could be used to stop a bullet. Ronnie placed herself in front of Marinus instinctively. Don and Shara pressed them back, though, shielding them from anyone who would attempt to come through the doorway. Priorities. Ronnie thought, sadly. Shara and Dawn considered themselves expendable in the place of the only two mates to the brothers they had fought beside for so many years, just as Ronnie considered herself expendable against the life of the child Marinus carried. And yet, they were all pawns as well, because someone knew the breed's weaknesses, and they had found a way to strike. Chapter 26 Tabor had promised Ronnie she would be safe. He had told her to lock the door, not to leave the room. No one would get to her. The acrid taste of failure coated his mouth. He had been wrong. He entered the back of the house at a low crouch, his rifle held ready as he swept through the kitchen, then stood aside to allow the other half-dozen men who followed his entrance. His blood pumped with the demand that he rush upstairs, that he blow the bastards to hell and back— but he knew the risk to Ronnie would only be greater. Kane's men were moving on the balconies to trap the bastards. Now Tabor and his men would move up the stairs to catch them on this end. Rage burned low in his gut, making it a fight to maintain control and proceed as he knew he had to. We have a breach. Don's voice was low, steady and calm, but Tabor could hear the horror that backed each word. We're compromised, Tabor. Each man had received the same transmission. Silent as the night, as deadly as the animals their DNA mixed with, the men surged up the stairs. They caught the first four outside Callan's room as they were opening the door. The assassins never knew what hit them. Tabor wrapped his arm around the neck of one of them and twisted with a sharp, deadly move that resulted in the muted, satisfying crunch. The others fell the same way, only to be pushed aside as Tabor opened the door slowly. He went in at a crouch, throttling his roar of triumph as they met the other group of would-be assassins in the middle of the room. Their eyes widened in surprise at the force they met as they turned to make their escape. At the same time, Kane's men stepped through the balcony entrance. Oh, look, Callan, they want to play, Tabor drawled as one raised his weapon. It was shot out of his hands before he could pull the trigger. Keep the women in there, Shara. Callan's voice was cold, deadly, as he stepped farther into the room and smiled the cold smile of death Tabor had rarely seen on his face. Hello, gentlemen. If you had knocked, we could have conversed civilly, he stated a bit too mildly. Your entrance into my home has left much to be desired. Tabor lowered his weapon as Callan handed his off to him. Tell me, Tabor, what should we do with such rude guests? Make nice? or have a late-night snack. Tabor allowed the snarl curling his lips to rumble through his chest. There was no mistaking the wary looks the assassins were now giving them. I miss dinner, Tabor said clearly. How about a snack? The four men jumped in startled surprise as twelve fully grown feline breed males growled in hungry menace. Wait! One of them spoke nervously, holding his hands out, his gun held in a clearly non-threatening manner as he laid it on the floor. No harm, no foul. No harm, no foul, 
Callan asked mildly as he eyed the gun on the floor before raising his head to stare at the man with brooding fury. Wrong. You broke into my home, attempted to harm my woman, and you think you're just going to walk out of here? We're just doing our job. One shook his head desperately. Come on, Lyons. You've always let us go before. Tabor recognized the voice. One of the mercenaries who had been sent home in defeat years before, smarting from the lazy, amused chase Callan had given him. The rules changed, Brighton. Callan snapped. You don't just walk away anymore. Callan, we question them first. Kane moved into the room, watching the breeds warily. You know the score. I know they're dead. It was as though the very air itself stilled with that announcement. There was no mercy in Callan's voice, no weakness. We'll send them back to their owners in pieces. Isn't that how they sent back our scout last month? Tabor's jaw tightened at the memory of it. The four assassins shifted nervously within the room. Come on, Callan dared them. Show me what you're made of. Personally, I smell the stink of a coward. Callan, Tabor warned him carefully. Step back, man. This is no time for mistakes. The mistake being an accidental death. Think of Marinus and the babe. She would have to go on without you. Callan. Her voice was faint, frightened. Kane, get this shit out of here. Lock them up with the other bastard you're holding until the garbage runs. We'll send them out then. Maybe in pieces. It was a threat that pushed the intruders into action. A flare of brilliant light pierced the darkness, blinding them as the assassins made their bid for freedom. Weapons were dropped as the breeds used senses well honed from years in captivity. They couldn't see, but they could smell, hear, and taste the evil flowing around them. Tabor's knife cleared its sheath at his side as he reached for the first man. The weapon sliced through flesh, severing the jugular vein. Blood sprayed around him as he dropped his enemy to the floor and turned for another. The brilliancy of the light had dissipated, and he came face to face with Ronnie's horror-filled expression. Rage and grief filled him because he knew what he looked like. He knew because he had seen Callan in a similar rage. His canines were bared, blood covering the lower part of his face, his chest. Another man's blood. The animal gloried in the scent of it the feel of his enemy's defeat, the knowledge that this time Tabor had been victorious. But the man he was screamed out in rage against the fates, the cruelties, and the single instant that his mate had seen the carnage and the animal within. The agonized roar that echoed through the house was one of rage, pain, and a protest against the realities of a life never asked for, never imagined. A protest against the loss of innocence he glimpsed in Ronnie's eyes. Chapter 27 The roar was unlike anything Ronnie had ever seen or heard. She stared at Tabor in shock as his head went back, his chest expanded, and the primal sound of rage and anguish ripped from his throat. Everyone stilled. The assassins lay dead. There had been no mercy. Ronnie hadn't expected any but neither had she expected to see the bitter, raging pain in Tabor's eyes as he dropped the assailant, either. Blood covered him, staining his cheek, his neck, the black cloth of his shirt, and running in a rivulet along the hardwood floor beneath his feet. God help her, how was she to ease so much pain? She wanted to run to him, to clean the blood from him and whisper how thankful she was that he lived— but she was held rooted to the floor, tears whispering down her cheeks as she witnessed the one thing she knew Tabor would not have wanted her to see. As the sound of his fury echoed around them, his head lowered, his green eyes glittering with an intensity she had never witnessed before and an expression that terrified her. His legs ate the distance between them as he moved to her, gripping her wrist and jerking her along behind him as he headed for the door. Tabor. Callan's protest was cut off when Tabor turned back to him with a snarl so threatening, so demanding, that the other man stood back, shaking his head in regret. Damn it, Callan, stop him! 
Marinus's voice was filled with fear as Ronnie was pulled from the room. No one would stop Tabor. No one could stop him now if they wanted to. Violence and lust swirled around him, tightening his body as the animals surged ever closer to the surface. Ronnie didn't even try to stop him. She followed him, nearly running to keep from being dragged behind him, her heart thundering in her chest, shock ripping its way through her body. He had barely caught the assassin before the other man let loose on the trigger of the submachine gun he held. The bullets would have ripped through the bathroom at that angle, possibly killing them all. She remembered all too clearly watching the knife slice through human flesh, the hatred and surprise on the other man's face as his gaze locked with hers. Tabor pulled her into the bedroom, slamming the door behind them before he turned to her. She didn't have time to gasp before he ripped the shirt from her back, leaving her breasts bare, nipples hard, as he worked at the closure on his jeans. Tabor. She didn't know what to say, what to do. Mine. He bared his teeth as he pushed his jeans over his hips, freeing the thick, desperate erection they had contained. She whimpered as he reached for her. The sweatpants were stripped from her, the legs ripping as he managed to free her from the material. He braced her against the padded arm of the couch, lifted her leg, and thrust hard and heavy inside the sensitive depths of her pussy. Ronnie arched in his arms, a strangled cry tearing from her throat as pleasure seared her body, even as pain lashed at her heart. Her gaze was locked with his, and in it she saw the bitter fury and anguish no man should have to bear. Blood stained his face, his neck. His eyes glittered with remorse, with hunger. Ronnie. His voice was strangled as he paused, buried to the hilt within her, a small measure of sanity replacing the bleak horror in his eyes. Ronnie. She covered his lips, her fingers trembling. Feel how wet I am for you, she whispered with a sad smile. How much I love you inside me, however you need me, whenever you need me. Tears filled her eyes as he blinked down at her. Part of the feral intensity had faded, leaving instead an overwhelming sadness. He would have killed me, and possibly Marinus as well, she whispered a second before he moved, his hips jerking convulsively, causing his cock to stroke the tender depths of her pussy with hard demand. I love you, Tabor, all of you, she cried out then. I love you. He groaned, a low, heavy sound filled with remorse, with thankfulness. He gathered her against him, cushioning her head on the unsoiled shoulder as his hands gripped her buttocks, his cock moving inside her. Long, slow strokes caressed the inner heat of her cunt as he kissed her throat, her neck. His thighs bunched, his back tensed, but still the deliberately careful movements never slowed. Mine, he whispered again. My woman, my love. His thrusts increased then, his breath coming hard and heavy, his hips driving the fierce erection as deep, as hard as he could as she clenched his shoulders, her legs wrapping around his hips, holding on for dear life as she felt her climax begin breaking over her. Seconds later, she felt him locking inside her, heard his groan, his hungry little growl, then the hard, heated blasts of his semen spurting in the tight depths of her pussy. I'm sorry, he whispered against her neck, his face damp, though with tears or his own sweat she wasn't certain. I am so sorry you had to see what I am. No, Tabor. Her hands smoothed over his hair, his shoulders. Never be sorry. I love everything you are. All of you. Such acceptance should not have been possible. Tabor stood under the hot spray of water, his eyes closed, his mind slowly clearing of the blood rage he had felt when he had seen that bastard ready to fire off a submachine gun in the women's direction. Helping to wash it away was Ronnie, her hands tender as she cleaned him thoroughly. She had washed the blood from his hair, his face, and had then proceeded to clean every inch of his body with the silken comfort of soap and cloth. Hot steam, 
and the scent of soap filled the large shower cubicle. The sounds of water rushing over him and Ronnie's soft hum whispered over his mind. With each rinse and careful soaping of his body, he felt more of the rage rinsing from his soul as well. With it came an incredible dragging weariness. He wanted nothing more than to curl up beside her and sleep. But there was so much left to do. All done, she whispered gently as she kissed his shoulder, her hands smoothing over his wet flesh, stroking him as the involuntary purr began to sound in his chest. He flinched at the sound. Shh. She cuddled against his chest, kissing it, her soft licks immeasurably tender. Do you know how much I love that sound? How much I love knowing I pleasure you? Comfort you? His eyes were closed against the melting pleasure seeping through him. He had never been taken care of. Ever. And here she was, so small and gentle, her voice whispering over him, her hands soothing him, taking away almost three decades of pain as she whispered her love for him. They can't take you. He suddenly groaned as emotion tore from him, his arms contracting around her, holding her close to his chest. I couldn't live without your touch, without your heat and passion, Ronnie. His throat felt tight from the feeling sweeping over him. I would rather die than face such a thing. We won't let them take me, Tabor. Together, we'll be okay. She pushed his hair back from his face as he opened his eyes, staring down at her, aching with the beauty he saw in her. I won't let them. He shook his head. I will have to kill again. And I will be right beside you when you do. She laid her fingers over his lips. I will always be here, Tabor, and we'll face the aftermath together, just as we are now. Did he deserve her? Hell no, he knew he didn't, but he knew there wasn't a chance he was going to let her get away from him either. He cleared his throat as he leaned back from her, groaning at the erection suddenly straining between them. I have to talk to Callan, he sighed. Then we'll take care of other things. He glanced down at his stubborn organ once again. Ronnie moved to turn off the shower, then grabbed the large towels she had laid out before leading him beneath the spray of water. He watched her in bemusement as she dried him like a babe. You would make an excellent mother, he whispered, imagining her bathing their child, caring for it as tenderly as she was caring for him, or more so. A soft flush stained her cheeks. I love children. She moved behind him, stroking the towel over his flesh as it soaked up the last of the water. Will you be upset when you conceive? He finally asked her as he cleared his throat uncomfortably. I should have thought before forcing my first kiss on you, before binding you so effectively. I should have explained. Wouldn't have changed anything. She came back around, grabbed another towel and dried herself. I would have wanted you anyway. He stilled, almost uncomprehendingly. Are you certain, Ronnie? She paused, then breathed in deeply as wry amusement crossed her face. Tabor, that nice big cock of yours isn't the only thing I had on my mind when I saw you, you know. It was you I missed all those months. It was you I dreamed of before you ever touched me sexually. It was your babies I've always dreamed of having. Otherwise... You would have found my knee driving your balls up to your throat when you did kiss me. Now are you satisfied? He winced. She wasn't above it. She had done just such a thing before. Understood? He nodded quickly. Good. Now I know Callan's waiting downstairs for you. I'm going to curl up on the couch until you get back. Kane and some others were bolting the glass doors in the place earlier, so maybe I can still manage a few hours of sleep before this place gets crazy again. She looked exhausted. The constant worry, sexual needs, and physical danger were taking a toll on her. Sleep in the bed. She shook her head. I can't sleep there without you, so hurry up. I'm getting pretty damn tired. He dressed in clean clothes while she pulled on one of his large T-shirts, the hem nearly reaching her knees, before grabbing a spare blanket from the quilt rack in the bedroom and heading for the sofa. I'll be back soon 
He bent and kissed her soft lips as she stared up at him drowsily. Hurry and come back. I'll need you soon. He could smell the need building in her. He nodded abruptly and turned and left the room. She couldn't live like this much longer, he thought. She was becoming exhausted, worn down. If she didn't conceive soon, then he worried that her health would suffer. But what, he wondered, would happen when she did conceive? Chapter 28 Ronnie was starved the next morning. She had awakened late, showered and dressed, and headed immediately to the kitchen as she followed the scents of bacon, eggs, and biscuits. When she entered the sunlit room, it was to find the three women talking softly over heaping plates and steaming coffee. Her mouth watered violently. On the stove, Shara grinned at her as she eyed the plates with starving desperation. I feel like someone cut a hole in my stomach. Ronnie sighed. Tabor's going to have to install a kitchen in that damned apartment he calls a bedroom if he insists on spending all his time up there. It won't be much longer. Dawn's soft, melodic voice had Ronnie stilling in surprise as she turned to look at the other woman. Excuse me? She said, confused. Dawn shrugged. You'll conceive soon. And you know this how? Ronnie asked as she lifted a plate from the center island and moved to the stove because I can smell it. Dawn, Shara spoke up warningly. Ronnie glanced over as the other woman shrugged and lowered her head to her food. So, what does it smell like? She frowned, poured a cup of coffee and carried it and her plate to the table. We aren't certain. Shara avoided her gaze. Dawn sounded certain enough. Is it information that can only be given if you kill me later? Marina smothered her laughter, though Shara frowned disapprovingly. No, but maybe something you don't want to hear yet. Ronnie glanced back over at Dawn. Give me a timeline and we'll see how good you are. She shoved a forkful of eggs in her mouth as Dawn turned to her in surprise. Within the next seventy-two hours, she finally said, and as soft as it was, her voice was more than confident. I noticed it with Marinus right before she and Callan were forced to run from the council— I saw her perhaps three days later, and she had already conceived. Your scent is similar. So how does this scent thing work? Ronnie swallowed the eggs and stared back at the other women. It was intriguing how easily the breeds could pick up such senses. They were completely human, no matter the propaganda Ronnie was certain was being spread, but the gifts their animal DNA gave them were amazing. It's just a change in the pheromones. Dawn shrugged, as though a special, delicate fruit is slowly ripening. It seems whatever change is being made to the ovaries and the eggs, it produces this scent as it progresses. Ronnie looked to Marinus. Ovary change? Her stomach dropped with a sudden, overriding fear. The baby is completely normal, Marinus laughed. We've had several sonograms done, and all the prenatal tests show everything is fine— You'll conceive a normal baby boy or girl. I promise, no kittens, as Cain is wont to tease us with. Fury flashed in Shara's eyes. Excuse me, I have work to do. Ronnie watched her in surprise, almost missing the regret that flickered across Marinus's face as Shara rose to her feet and deposited her plate in the sink. Tell Callan I'll be on patrol if he needs me, she told Marinus as she walked from the room. Tell Cain to get fucked. Ronnie winced. That's his problem, Marina sighed as she glanced at Dawn. She won't let him touch her. I don't blame her, and it's time for me to go as well. I have detail on Mr. Andrews in just a few minutes. We don't need him getting any more transmissions out. Ronnie stilled, her coffee cup poised at her lips as her eyes widened. She set the cup down carefully as the ramifications of those few words hit her like a fist to the stomach. He's the reason they knew which room we were in, she realized painfully, swallowing tightly as the food she had eaten threatened to come back up. He told them where we were. Marina sighed heavily. We can't be certain, Ronnie. They're still tracking the transmission. He sent a transmission out yesterday and last night we were attacked. 
The man found every weakness and security the estate possessed by sheer luck, I guess. She snapped bitterly as she rose to her feet. He nearly got us all killed, and he's still here, given the chance to try again. Rage roiled through her chest. Dear God, what would it take to neutralize the threat her father had always been within her life? He was only growing more determined now to destroy her than he had been in the years before. Ronnie, Callan and Tabor are taking care of it, Marina said gently. Let them do what they have to do. Ronnie speared her with a hard, vengeful look. I don't think so, Marinus. Not this time. Not again. Chapter 29 Ronnie was none too pleased with Tabor. His refusal throughout the day to get rid of Reginald or to allow her to find out what the hell he wanted only stroked her fear higher. He was dangerous, to her and to Tabor. He had already proven that. The battle she had fought with Tabor earlier only drove home the fact that Reginald was growing more conniving, more evil than ever before. They couldn't prove he had made the transmission. They only suspected it. To effectively put a stop to any threat he represented, they had to be certain, just as they needed to know for certain who he was working with. The men who had attacked last night were no more than hired guns. Sometimes they worked for the council, sometimes they worked for other sources. There was more than one source popping up in the world that had decided the breeds didn't deserve life. Reginald, if involved, was only one of many. He was her father. He was the man her mother had loved. Her sweet, gentle mother. Ronnie laid her head against the cool glass of the balcony door and fought the pain ripping through her chest. Margie Andrews had been one of the kindest, gentlest souls. Ronnie barely remembered her but she remembered how her mother sounded, the soft lullabies she sang to her, the whispered promises of a better life, and she remembered her mother crying. It was one of her strongest memories from childhood. Her mother's cries, muffled, pleading as she begged Reginald for mercy. Please, Reggie, please don't hurt me. Ronnie flinched as the words echoed through her mind. It was her last memory of her mother the last words she had heard Margie speak. The next morning her mother left for work. An hour later, she was dead. Weak bitch, Reginald had muttered at the funeral. She didn't fight enough. Ronnie had never been certain what he meant by those words, but as she grew older, they had stayed with her. Had he been behind her mother's accident, or had it been another of his muttered ramblings in regards to her mother's frail health? She had been alone then, and she felt alone now. She stared into the darkness, fighting the old fears, the old wounds. She could feel the brink she stood on, and it terrified her, the knowledge slowly building inside her. Her mother had loved Reggie with a single, driving, obsessive emotion that had terrified the young Ronnie. It hadn't made sense to her how easily her mother would bow to his demands. She'd push aside her own wants and needs in deference to him— even more than that, she pushed aside her daughters. How many nights had dinner been a meal of cornbread and the meager amount of potatoes her mother had grown in the backyard because Reggie had taken all the money for himself? Or the times she had watched him slap her, scream at her, because they had eaten the last of the groceries in the cupboard, leaving him to fend for himself? Her fists clenched. She had sworn she would never need a man so desperately— had sworn she would never let herself be used, broken because she loved. And here she was, unable to break away from the man who had that very power. It didn't matter then that Tabor had always held her with tenderness, had always given her heat and security rather than his fists. Her fears raged inside her as hot and bleak as the heat that throbbed in her pussy. For some reason nature had taken the choice away from her and Tabor both— he was a man, fully mature, who had faced unspeakable horrors, and beside him she felt like the child she feared she was, frightened, confused. She squared her shoulders and breathed in roughly. Okay, so she knew her problem. That was the first step to fixing it, right? Her emotions had terrified her months before, once she realized how deeply Tabor could hurt her. That letter she thought he had sent had destroyed her, broken a part of her— part of her fighting, trying to heal only now that she was with him again. 
When your heart loves, Ronnie, there's no fight in it. She remembered the saddened words her mother had whispered to her one night after another of Reginald's attacks. Sometimes, protecting those you love, no matter what it takes, is more important than your own heart. And Ronnie knew now that she had to find a way to protect Tabor. He didn't know how vicious, how cruel Reginald could be. He couldn't, or else he would have never allowed him to stay. Tabor knew loyalty, a need for freedom. He could never believe her father would do anything it took to achieve his own aims, even destroy his daughter. And Ronnie knew her destruction would bring Reginald a wealth of satisfaction. Finally, he had a weapon against her, and soon, she knew, he would use it. Ronnie. Tabor's voice, as dark as midnight, wrapped around her senses as he stepped into the room. Immediately the pulsing arousal that flowed through her body intensified. She turned from the window, pulling the gun from her waistband and laying it out on a nearby table as she approached him. She reached for the hem of her shirt and stripped it quickly over her head. He was hers. Damn him. Damn Reginald and her fears. She tossed the shirt to the floor and towed off her sneakers. Son of a bitch. His hands went to his jeans. Take me. She challenged him as she pushed her own jeans from her hips and stepped out of them quickly. I dare you. There was a fever rising in her body. She didn't want the bed. She didn't want gentle, mindless sex. She wanted to still the volcanic sparks of heat flaring inside her as she tore aside his control. She wanted to soothe him, enrage him, stroke and flail at him. His eyes narrowed on her. She loved it when he did that. The jade green color sparkled dangerously, giving him a primal, predatory appearance. He growled, a feline rumble of warning as she smiled back at him in sensual challenge. I could, he told her softly, watching as she moved around him, keeping her within sight at all times. I could take you down and mount you in a second, Ronnie. She trembled at the dark warning. Her pussy spilled more of its slick juices along her swollen lips as her womb rippled in anticipation. She watched him breathe in deeply and knew he could smell the incredible heat filling her body. He tensed as he did, the muscles of his abdomen rippling as his cock jerked in anticipation. Do you know what you're tempting, Ronnie? He asked her. His voice silky as she moved behind him, stepped closer, then smoothed her hands down the bunched contours of his back. Like rough silk, the soft pelt that covered his body tickled her palms as she stroked him. He shuddered beneath her hands. I thought cats liked to be stroked. She leaned forward, catching her breath as the hard pinpoints of her nipples brushed against his back. The rumbling growl that vibrated in his chest caused her to shiver in delight. It erotically stroked her senses, her arousal. Her hands moved around his waist, sliding across the clenched muscles of his stomach. I used to dream of touching you, she whispered as her lips smoothed over the striking tattoo on his left shoulder. The snarling jaguar, its eyes narrowed in fury, ears laid back warningly. I dreamed of making you moan, of hearing you whisper how desperately you wanted me. I want you until I feel broken inside from it, Ronnie. He stayed still, tense as her hands moved over him. Can I heal you? She laid her cheek against his shoulder, hearing the loneliness in his voice, the same dark emotion she had felt herself for so long. He shuddered under her hands as they caressed over his own straining nipples. You heal me with every touch. His arms were bunched, his body vibrating with the tight leash he had on his lust. Ronnie smiled slowly. Could she break the control? Could she remake them both in the fires that would explode from it? If they survived it? Her hands moved lower, tickling over the washboard stomach, heading unerringly for the strong stalk of his cock rising from his body. Ronnie... The word held immeasurable warning. Yes, Tabor? She swallowed tightly as her hands caressed the crease of his thighs. He was close. So very close. 
she felt him prepare to move and jumped back. She laughed low and deep at the primitive growl coming from his throat as he reached for her and missed. She had a feeling the missing part was deliberate when she turned back and realized he was slowly stalking her. She moved along the room, watching him carefully, more than aware of the tension filling the room with a sexual awareness so thick it wrapped around her like gossamer threads of need. I'm going to take you down, he whispered as she skirted the couch, placing its width between them. I'm going to mount you, Ronnie, then I'm going to ride you until you're screaming beneath me. Her cunt beat out a demand that she dropped to her knees then and there. She didn't think so. Been there, done that, she drawled. Be original, baby. He snarled. Her pulse raced. Oh, that was the sexiest sound. Deep, vibrating in intensity. He moved then, a smooth, graceful leap that had her eyes widening in shock as he came over the couch. Her second's hesitation was her downfall. Even as she was turning to run, his arm hooked around her waist and he lifted her from the floor. Ronnie fought frantically. Her body was burning, her cunt throbbing in desperation as adrenaline surged through her. She bucked in his arms as he laughed, her low scream of frustration and furious lust echoing around the room as he took her to the floor. There were no preliminaries. There was no need for them. The slick cream of her need dampened her thighs, flowing thick and hot from her pussy. His cock surged into the syrupy thickness filling her vagina as she arched back, screaming out at the pleasure. Been here, baby? He pounded inside her ruthlessly, his hands holding her hips relentlessly as his cock thrust hard and deep in the tight depths. Done this? The depths he reached had her shrieking in part pain, part pleasure, her cunt gripping him, the muscles clenching spasmodically as he fucked her with a hard, driving rhythm. It wasn't like the first time, and only now did she realize the control he had exerted even then, a control he had lost this time. She pushed back into each driving thrust, crying out for him, her pussy clenching on the thick intruder, driving her insane with the need for orgasm. Talk to me, baby. His hand lifted from her hip a second before he delivered a firm, sharp slap to the rounded curve of her buttock. Tell me if we've been here, Ronnie. Shock singed her then. Oh, hell, that felt too good. She whimpered with it, bucking against him, jerking against his hold. She fought him, gasping at the pleasure of his tight grip as he restrained her, the sharp sting of his hand on her ass as he punished her. Done this? She dared him, then threw her head back in an agony of pleasure as his hand landed on her ass again. Done this? His hand moved again, sliding along the curves, his fingers caressing, driving her insane as they dipped between her thighs, sliding through the juices collecting on the lips of her sex. Keep talking, baby, he growled as he circled her clit. Let's see if this old cat can not teach you a few new tricks. His fingers rubbed, caressed, delicately milked her clit to the powerful thrusts driving into her pussy. She couldn't breathe. Ronnie fought for oxygen as the almost violent intensity of sensations ripped through her. Too many, too fast. She could feel her pussy tightening, her womb convulsing. When the explosion came, she felt every emotion contained in her soul tearing free. Her orgasm slammed through her as she rose from the floor convulsively, her arms reaching back for him, her scream a strangled plea for mercy. More! There was no mercy. His arm locked around her waist, lifting her, his erection sinking deeper inside her, stroking her from an angle that kept the fiery intensity of her release echoing through her body. She was being driven mad. Even her flesh became a traitor to her desperate need to fight the overwhelming orgasm. The minute the first eased, he threw her into another. His cock was stroking inside her, fucking her with a relentless demand she couldn't deny. She arched against him, her hands falling to the tight muscles of the arm holding her, clenching, fighting for some hold on reality as she was thrown once again into an abyss of ever-deepening sensation. She was screaming. 
She didn't know what she was screaming, only knew the words were fighting to be free, to be heard. She loved. She needed. And then she felt him. From the position they were in, she felt the first change. His cock tightened, jerked. Then it seemed as though the flared head thickened. Another, smaller erection bloomed beneath it, locking his cock deep inside her as it caressed an ultra-sensitive bundle of nerves hidden there. Press. Stroke. In that second she was hurled into a kaleidoscope world of clashing colors, heartbeats, surging blood, and an animal's roar. And a knowledge she knew would change them both forever. Chapter 30 Ronnie would have preferred to clear her mind, to drift within the safety of the world Tabor was trying to build around her. At least she had thought that was what she preferred, until hours later, after the demands of their bodies had been met and sanity began to return. It was then she knew it was time to face her own life. She was only twenty-two to Tabor's thirty, but even more than the eight years' difference in their ages, there was a whole world of experience as well. He had lived with fear, unspeakable cruelty, and death, even before he had become a man. He had known the evil that filled the minds of the Council, the men who created him, who trained him. He had been decades older than she, even when he was a teenager. Ronnie knew her own experiences in growing up didn't even come close to the pain he had known. She was a baby in comparison. But she was also his mate. She wanted to be more. She wanted to be strong enough to stand by his side, strong enough to fight with him. She couldn't do that if she allowed either of them to hide from the truth. She would let him protect her to an extent, but after that, she needed to stand beside him to ease the man who fought for supremacy over his DNA. The man who needed to love, to find at least a safe haven for his soul. He hadn't told her he loved her, but she would deal with that later. One step at a time, she thought, one growth at a time. She would get there eventually, but first things first. Cats have barbs, Ronnie said lazily, her fingers playing gently through the long, silken strands of his hair. He had been purring. It amazed her. He had tried to stop, had even laughed at himself earlier because he couldn't, though she had seen the worry in his eyes that it would disgust her. Quite the opposite. She now knew how to tell if her lover was pleased, happy, content. Destroying that contentment for even a moment was something she hated to do, but it was something they needed to clear up. He tensed in her arms. His head still lay against her chest, but rather than the sated relaxation that had filled him, a watchful tension now moved over his body. The soft vibration in his chest had stopped, though her fingers had never ceased the slow caress through his hair. Yeah, they do. His hold tightened only marginally. People think because I'm young, I'm completely dumb. She laughed softly at this. Even before you marked me, you always handled me with kid gloves, never doing or saying anything you thought would upset me. Letting me face life isn't going to break me. It was never because I thought you were dumb, Ronnie. He sighed as he moved from her arms, sitting up so he could stare down at her thoughtfully. I wanted to protect you. That's all I've ever wanted. And she realized how true that was. She had known it when she had been only a child, and she saw it now. A part of him had to protect her, otherwise he would never be content, never be secure. I don't want to be protected from everything, Tabor. She turned on her side, moving into the embrace he created by opening his arms and pulling her close. Her head lay against his chest now as he breathed out roughly. She could feel the protest building in him, and knew he would always try to protect not just her body, but her emotions as well. She didn't want to be protected from growth. I don't want you hurt, he whispered against her hair. Not in any way, Ronnie. It makes me crazy thinking of it. It always has. The world can be dark, baby. Scary as hell. I never wanted you to see how bad it could be. The dark magic of his voice couldn't hide the bitter memories running through it. That won't work, Tabor. How can I be anything to you if I can't understand the life you've lived? Do you think I don't know some of the evil out there? 
For God's sake, how many times did you have to come rescue me from Reginald's enemies, from men who called and told a teenager how many different ways they were going to fuck her in exchange for her father's betrayal? She had never told him the full extent of the terror that had her running to him through the years, the true measure of the fears she had faced. She had known he would confront Reginald, and she had been terrified of the consequences. How could she have lived if he was harmed because of her? His arms flexed, bunched in anger. I would have killed him if I had known, Ronnie. I may kill him yet, he swore. You're better than he is, she sighed. And he's not worth the complications. He's not worth the stain on your soul. She rose up, staring him in the eye. I know what you are, Tabor. I know what happens when you come inside me. You don't have to hide me from life. All I need is to know you'll be beside me. I always have been. He shook his head in confusion. Why would I leave now, Ronnie? You're mine. I told you that. She rolled her eyes impatiently. Tabor, I don't belong to you. The hell you don't. Stubborn male arrogance lit every word. I warned you before, baby, and I'm telling you now. Once I had you, it was too late to rethink the issue. I won't play games with you, I won't lie to you, and I'll sure as hell never let you leave me. Good thing I'm content to stay. For now, she muttered as she plopped back down on the bed, staring up at the ceiling with a frown. Must be the animal coming out in you, though I never knew cats to be possessive. You're going against type, Tabor. He grunted mockingly as he stared down at her, a brow lifting with an expression of superiority. Really? He drawled his voice deepening. Says who? Wild Kingdom, she snapped without heat. Wild Kingdom needs to research a bit more. He laughed as he settled down in the bed beside her, drawing her close to the warmth of his body as he pulled the sheet over them. I don't know, she yawned. They seem pretty sure of it. You sure you can't mate anyone else? That one worried her, more than she wanted to admit. She would hate to have to kill him after getting used to this crazy situation he had thrown her in. Don't know, and I sure as hell don't intend to find out, he grumped. Mating you is about to kill me. I doubt I'll be able to walk straight when I get up in the morning, which isn't far off. Go to sleep. He reached over, extinguishing the light on the small table by the bed. Silence filled the room. Weariness dragged at her body. You should make him leave, Tabor. She voiced the fear about Reginald that she couldn't seem to rid herself of. He's dangerous. Once again, silence stretched between them for long moments. We'll watch him, Ronnie, he promised her. Remember, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Reginald will show his hand eventually. When he does, one of us will be there to stop him. She sighed wearily. She couldn't push the suspicion of her mother's death from her mind, Someone had killed her. She had known the mountainous roads in all conditions. She would have never gone over that cliff on a perfect summer day. I'll protect you, Ronnie. His confidence washed over her like a comforting wave of warmth. I don't doubt that, Tabor, she sighed. It's not my safety I worry about. It's yours. Go to sleep, baby. He tucked her closer, his arms strong and warm, sheltering her. Tomorrow is soon enough to deal with it. She closed her eyes, her hand moving from the bed to her abdomen. She could feel the change in her body. The desperate heat was cooling, leaving only a more natural desire now. A comforting warmth. Would it happen so soon? She wondered. Sleep. His hand covered hers. Tomorrow is soon enough. Chapter 31 Okay, listen up, kitties. Kane strode into the large kitchen like a hard wind bent on shaking up whatever previous safe zone had been established. Get your noses out of the cream, we have problems here. The morning ritual of after-breakfast coffee had run smoothly the few days Ronnie had been there, but it wasn't a ritual Kane had partaken of until now. She had seen Marinus's older, taciturn brother only once in the past days since her arrival. He watched everything and everyone suspiciously. He was handsome, 
with his dark hair and striking blue eyes. He was tall, not as broad as the feline breed males, but exuding a powerful grace that drew the eye. This morning he was dressed in jeans that conformed to every muscle in his long legs and emphasized his tight, hard stomach. A black t-shirt was tucked into the waistband that was cinched with a plain leather belt. On that belt he wore a holstered gun with such casual confidence that it seemed to be an extension of his body. He's going to call me a kitten one time too many, Shara muttered with low violence from beside Ronnie as she stared down at her coffee cup. The interactions among the small pride of feline breeds fascinated Ronnie. They were completely loyal to each other and the other breeds who had slowly been making their way to the estate set up for them. Like a large extended family, they fussed and grumbled with each other, but they fought tenaciously for each other as well. Kane, as always, your entrances leave much to be desired, Marinus sighed as Callan chuckled in amusement. Marinus watched her brother and the slender feline female, Shara, with wary concern. He takes some getting used to, Tabor told Ronnie as she glanced over at the tall, eagle-eyed man holding several reports in his hand as he poured his own coffee. Kane was dangerous. There was no other word for it. His eyes were deep pools of blue ice, suspicious and surging with an inner energy that made Ronnie nervous. Evidently, it made Shara nervous as well. She shifted in her seat, casting the man a look of simmering anger. Marinus, keep your ass in the house, period. You and Miss Andrews. I don't know how the hell those snipers got into the compound, but the one left living doesn't want to play with us yet and give the information out. A cruel slash of a smile curved his lips as he leaned back against the counter, lifting the coffee cup for a tentative sip. It assured those watching that soon, the sniper left alive would be more than happy to play whatever game Kane suggested. She would have shivered at the thought if the situation weren't so dangerous. So, what have you managed to find out? Callan asked quietly as he leaned back in his chair at the head of the table and watched the other man intently other than the fact that our new friend is temporarily antisocial. Kane grunted, scratching his cheek absently with the hand that still held several wrinkled pages of paper. There's a possibility this isn't a council job. His voice turned decidedly more dangerous. I'm not sure who is behind it yet, but we're getting close. From what I've managed to gather, it's leaning closer to a small, select group who believes the world is better off without your particular brand of genetics mixing into the soup pot. Ronnie glanced at the expressions of the breeds gathered around the large kitchen table. Their expressions varied between contempt and anger. Hmm, wonder if they have nice, accessible daughters. Ronnie's eyes widened as she looked down the table to Tanner. The sexual threat inherent in his voice had surprised her. He was a Bengal breed, Tabor had told her, and he looked it. His thick, long black hair was lit with several shades of gold and framed his dark, intent face. He looked like a fallen angel, oozing sex appeal and lusty excesses. His amber gaze glittered angrily beneath his long, sooty lashes as his eyes narrowed dangerously. Ronnie had known Tanner as long as she had Tabor, and the young man, though friendly and flirtatious, had always held that cutting edge of perilous intent as though he saw into the soul and often judged it harshly. Tanner, Callan grumbled a hard-edged warning. Come on, Cal, I can mix the soup up for them right good, the younger man snorted. I won't hurt anyone. We don't have time for cat fights, Kane snapped. He was rewarded by more than one growl and several animalistic snarls in response. The grin that crossed his lips was amused and easy, despite the threats that lay thick and unvoiced in the sound. Get to the point, Kane, Callan told him softly, but the very silkiness of his warning told Ronnie much more. The older feline breed was growing tired of the little digs Marinus's brother was directing their way. The sniping didn't make sense. The easy familiarity she had seen him display with the breeds on other occasions had suggested he both respected and cared for the members of Callan's pride yet his actions now hinted at a deeper tension. Point is, Kane set his coffee down and glanced down at the papers he held. Several radical members of previous race groups have decided to band together. They call themselves liberators. 
Their main agenda is the death of any and all genetically altered humans. They don't have a lot of money backing them, but they have firepower and several ex-military members. Looks like it's hunting season, boys and girls. And guess who's the catch of the day? Silence reigned for long, tension-filled moments. We expected this. Despite his words, Callan's voice was weary, saddened. How close are we to finishing the security measures? Close, Kane shrugged. But no system is perfect, Callan. We have a lot of ground to cover and our perimeters are being tested from every angle. They're quiet for the most part, not tipping their hands, but they're watching. And rumor has it they're attempting to put a spy in place. Ronnie stiffened, her fists clenching in her lap as she fought to deny her own suspicions now. So catch him, Shara snapped as she glanced over at Kane. What are you here for, anyway? You socialize in the house more than you actually get any work done. At least I'm willing to be sociable. His smile was tight, hard. Unlike some of us in this house, I can actually manage to remain civil for more than five minutes at a time. Oh, really? She drawled sarcastically. Funny, I hadn't noticed him at all the little snipes and half-veiled insults. Forgive me, Kane. I'm certain you're doing your best. His eyes narrowed. The scene playing out before Ronnie's fascinated gaze was better than any soap opera ever invented. Keep pushing me, Shara, and you might not like the consequences. Undercurrents of emotion thickened between the two of them. I don't like you, period. She rose to her feet, glancing at Callan. When you have real answers, Cal, let me know. All he has is his damned conspiracy theories, and I've grown tired of them. She swept out of the room, her head held high, a mane of long, incredibly thick blonde hair swaying past her shoulders and catching the light as she passed through the doorway. One of these days, Kane muttered. Leave her alone, Kane. Marinus's voice was flat and hard now. You're pushing too hard. Her brother shot her a surprised look. I'll push harder before it's over with, he snapped. And you can watch it, or you can tell me what the hell the deal is. Your choice, Mary. Either way, I'll get the answers I want. Enough already, Callan ordered, his frustration level evidently reaching its breaking point as he stood to his feet and faced the other man. Deal with your personal life off my time, Kane. Then he turned to the youngest of the breed males. Tanner, get into town tonight. See what you can find out from those sources you have in place. I want to know who and what is involved in all this. I'd start asking our new visitor first. The rough, grumbling voice that entered the fray came from the kitchen doorway. Ronnie recognized the breed from the night before. Merc, she thought they had called him. He stared at them with placid, deep brown eyes, but nothing could hide the aura of death surrounding him. Meaning? Callan asked him softly. Meaning I caught him trying to sneak around the weapons shed earlier. When I put a stop to that, one of the men assigned to watch him caught him trying to break into the communications offices. That boy has the Grim Reaper sitting on his shoulder, Callan, and I'm of a mind to set that dark visage free. Chapter 32 I want you to make Reginald leave now. Ronnie turned to face Tabor as they entered the sheltered garden area outside the kitchen. It was the only outside area Tabor and the others would allow the women to go to when the house became too stifling. It was a large courtyard, but stretching overhead from wall to wall were thick wooden beams holding a multitude of sheltering vines. Even in the full heat of the day, it was a cool escape from the tension slowly filling the house. She moved deeper into the small grotto, brushing against the thick, sheltering shrubs and low-growing trees that had been placed around a central fountain. A variety of flowering bushes filled the air with the heady scent of their blooms. The fountain splashed playfully, infusing the area with moisture, lending to it an air of sensuality and relaxation, an atmosphere she fought desperately as she tried to convince Tabor to have her father escorted from the estate. She laid her palm against her abdomen, trying to still the nerves that roiled within her stomach. The severe heat that had afflicted her over the past days was steadily easing. She was pregnant, and she was terrified. More frightened than she had ever been in her life. Ronnie, let us do our job, 
Tabor told her softly as she turned back to him, watching her with a warmth, a caring she couldn't face yet. What exactly is your job? She asked him bitterly. Standing around waiting on someone to kill you? Waiting for Reginald to do whatever he came here to do? My job is to contain any threat to this estate. His voice was pitched low, but she heard the rough grumble that echoed in his chest. Do you think I can't protect you? Ronnie rolled her eyes in frustration. It has nothing to do with my faith in you and everything to do with what I know Reginald is capable of. Her hand sliced through the air between them as she went nose to nose with him. She could feel the fear building in her, feel the sick, awful sensation in the pit of her stomach that warned her that Reginald was scheming at his worst. It had been in his gaze, in the calculating demand as he was pulled from the house the night before. He was neck deep in trouble and determined to pull her into it as well. You forget, I know him just as well as you do, Ronnie, he reminded her carefully. I know what he's capable of. She hated that restrained sound to his voice, as though he was choosing each word, each move with her, as though he only gave her the parts of himself that he wanted her to see. Why give him the chance, Tabor? She wanted to scream at him, but she kept her voice to a careful hiss as she paced farther along the courtyard. Why? The risk is too great. What can he do? Tabor asked her logically. She hated logic. She hated his logic. So cool and confident. We need to know who hired him and what he wants. If we run him off, we may not know until it's too late to contain the threat. We can't risk that, Ronnie. You're risking your life instead. She shook her head, pushing her trembling hands into the pockets of her jeans as she sat down on one of the wide stone benches at the farthest edge of the courtyard. My life is at risk every day, baby. He sighed roughly as he sat down beside her, pulling her into his arms. You think I don't know what you're fighting so hard? That I don't know you're carrying my child, Ronnie? That I couldn't sense the change in your body as it happened? She stiffened in his arms. You can't be certain of that. Marinus went out of heat when she conceived. The desperate need isn't driving you insane now, Ronnie. It's easing. He nuzzled her neck his warm breath blowing across her skin with such pleasure she shivered. That doesn't mean anything. She tried to shrug him away, to keep her mind from becoming clouded with need as another, more intense heat began to fill her. Just because Marinus is pregnant doesn't mean I am. The natural desire was something she thought she would never feel again. Something she could have done without— she could have denied the hold Tabor had on her so much easier if he didn't make her crazy to fuck him with just the feel of his breath on her neck. She arched involuntarily to the caress, her breath catching on a sigh of longing. The shaded, grotto-like atmosphere suddenly turned heated, too moist, sensitizing her, sucking her into the earthy lust that always shook her at the mere sight of him. He chuckled. The sound was low, heated as he lifted her against him, turning her until she sat draped across his lap. Let me up. She struggled against him, but knew her heart wasn't in being released. His arms held her easily as he looked at her, his eyes narrowing, becoming darker, more intense. Ronnie shivered under the look. I still want to fuck you crazy, right here, Ronnie, he whispered wickedly as his hand slid up her thigh beneath her soft cotton shirt, then curled around the curve of her breast. Ronnie felt her nipples peak in throbbing expectation. They throbbed, ached for his touch, his mouth, anticipating the feel of his tongue rasping over them erotically. Her womb clenched in need, her pussy weeping, preparing for the invasion that every cell of her body screamed out for. Someone will see us. She fought not to pant. Besides, we were arguing. You were arguing. I was disagreeing, he pointed out, his voice less than patient as he pushed her shirt over the full mounds of her breasts. And I have finished disagreeing and will now begin feasting. Her cunt throbbed at the sound of his voice, her nipples aching as his head lowered. Ronnie watched, seeing the sudden sensual fullness of his lips as they opened, 
his tongue as it curled around the stiff peak first, searing it with a blistering pleasure. Oh, God, Tabor. She couldn't stop her desperate moan as his mouth then covered the engorged tip. His tongue swirled with wet heat around the sensitized bud, his mouth drawing on her, cheeks flexing. Ronnie couldn't help but watch. It was the most sinfully sensual sight she had ever seen. His dark face flushed with arousal. For her. It was for her. His attention solely on the pleasure he took from suckling her nipple. The pleasure he gave was nearly orgasmic. His hand held the sensitive flesh, pushing the mound higher, intensifying her sensations as his tongue stroked over the elongated tip. She could feel her juices gathering from within her suddenly clenching vagina, then spilling past the narrow channel, coating the rapidly sensitizing lips of her cunt. Her clit ached, pulsed in time to the rhythmic suckling of his mouth. He moaned against her the sound vibrating along nerve endings that screamed out for relief. Delicious. He lifted his head, her nipple falling from his mouth with a smooth, moist, popping sound. Come here, baby. Let me undress you. I'll show you. Tabor, I need you back in here if you have time. Callan's voice called through the courtyard. We'll be waiting for you in the office. The intrusion was like a bucket of ice water sweeping over Ronnie as she stiffened in Tabor's arms, her eyes widening in alarm. She couldn't believe she had forgotten about the inhabitants of the house, how easily they could step outside and be witness to the erotic love play behind the shelter of the thickened foliage surrounding them. Damn it, he left me the hell alone while you were in heat, he muttered. Now he'll be interrupting me every damned chance he gets. What? She shook her head as she moved quickly from his lap, jerking her shirt back over her breasts. Why? Tabor winced as he stood, the ridge of his erection pressing thick and hard against the front of his jeans. I did it to him, he shrugged with an unapologetic grin. We all did. Hell, still do if we get the chance. He gets irritated. There was a shrug to his powerful shoulders, an almost light-hearted grin that tugged at her heart. How often had she seen such a smile on his face? His eyes were almost glowing with humor, his lips tipped into a comfortable smile. Boyish. Amazement washed over Ronnie as she realized what was so different about this smile, this look. She had never seen it on his face before, had never known him to relax enough to allow any playfulness out. I wish he had just kicked you instead of waiting to punish me as well, she sighed roughly. Go on, do whatever you were going to do. I want to sit here for a while. She sat back down on the bench, her knees weak, her heart beating roughly as she stared up at him. God help her, he was too handsome for words. And she was terrified of losing him again. Maybe this time permanently. I'll be back soon. He knelt in front of her then, his gaze meeting hers as he placed his palm against her lower stomach. Stay in the house, Ronnie, until I get back. Take care of our baby. Static pleasure washed over her body at the sound of his voice. It was husky, deep, caressing her nerve endings like a physical touch. But even more than the husky throb of his words was the unvoiced emotion behind them. You can't be sure. She shook her head, confused by the shifting awareness that she felt. It wasn't just the lessening of the unnatural arousal. It was the acceptance within herself. She was learning it wasn't so much her body that couldn't stand life without Tabor. It was her heart, her soul. How bleak and empty her life had been before he made her live again, made her fight, made her learn to be who she was. In a few short days, he had given her the very things she had longed for the most, his heart to nurture, his soul to protect, his body to enjoy, and love to her heart's content and a family. With Tabor and the child they had created, she had all she had ever dreamed of. I can smell the changes in your body, he whispered. Just as I could smell your heat, I can smell our child. Do you have any idea the pleasure that brings me, Ronnie? I, who had nothing, no one to call my own in all the years of my life, now have not only you, but the child we've created together. 
she could see the hopes and the fears that filled him at that moment. He stared at her, everything he was, everything he dreamed reflected in the brilliance of his eyes. His brows lowered, his expression becoming intent, fierce. Then he lowered his head, his body bending further until he could place his lips where his hands had been. Ronnie gasped as her fingers gripped his shoulders, his arms going around her, holding her close as he pressed his face into her lower stomach. He was so strong and sure in her arms, bending to her, his attention on the child he knew was forming within her. I love you, Ronnie. The words could only barely be heard, but they nearly stopped her heart with emotion. Know that. For years I have longed for you, loved you. You complete me. He didn't give her time to answer him, no time to accept the emotion he whispered against her flesh. He rose quickly to his feet and stalked away from her. No kiss, no touch, no chance for her to reject what he had given her. As though she could ever reject him. Ronnie lowered her head as she fought her tears, fought her own steadily rising emotions. No matter how much she feared the consequences, she loved him, had always loved him. But damn if he wasn't too stubborn for words. Chapter 33 Did you think you can hide from me forever, girly? Reginald's voice was a serrated intrusion into the peaceful atmosphere of the mansion's living room. Ronnie knew she should have expected Reginald to do something stupid. He had never been the smartest man she had ever known, but she hadn't expected him to be one of the dumbest either. Actually, she hadn't thought he would be inventive enough to slip past the feline breeds on guard while Tabor was out of the house but he did. One minute she was alone in the living room watching the arrival of several wounded breed males outside. The next second she was jerked around roughly to face the father she had always loathed. What are you doing here? She jerked away from him, her eyes going to the open door of the room. Do you think someone won't know you're here, Reginald? The look in his eyes made her stomach pitch in nervous awareness of the danger he could represent. Doesn't matter if they do find out, he sneered angrily. I'm just here visiting my little girl. Or did you forget you had a father? Every chance I get, she snapped back. What the hell are you up to here? Don't you have any more sense than to piss these men off, Reggie? His smile was terrifying. Confident, assured, stretching lewdly across his face as his blue eyes glittered with malice. What have you done, Reggie? Ronnie could feel the last thread of hope she ever possessed where her father was concerned snap. Listen to me, Ronnie. They aren't natural. They aren't human. He hissed with a fanatical fervor that terrified her. I know he put that mark on you. All I need is for you to leave with me. Just for a little while, girl, and let my friends have some blood work. Just some little tests, that's all. You can't be serious. She shook her head slowly, edging away from him, suddenly more terrified of him than anything else she had ever faced in her life. I'm not going anywhere with you. If this is why you came here, then you may as well give it up now. He frowned, a dark, sinister lowering of his brow that had her heart rate picking up nervously. He had never looked at her like that. She had never seen such hatred, such utter contempt in another human's eyes before and she had never imagined it would be directed at her. You will come with me, Ronnie, he snapped, watching her with a feral intensity that bordered on the insane. There's no telling what he's planted in your belly while you've been in his bed. Do you think I'm going to allow the world to know a kid of mine is a dirty animal fucker? She flinched at the disgust, the terrible fury in his voice. You're insane, she whispered. They have as much right to live as anyone else, Reginald, more so. Oh, spare me your pretty little speeches, he spat contemptuously. Tell me, girl, how long have you been fucking the bastard anyway? Was that why he threatened to kill me if I let any of my friends around you? Wanted his pussy all to himself, did he? Ronnie backed up as he edged closer to her. She could feel the hatred, black and vile, pouring from him. I won't answer that. She snapped, refusing to allow her fear of him to show. 
How old were you when he first found you, anyway, hiding like a snot-nosed brat in those hills? Ten? Eleven? Was he fucking you then, Ronnie? Is that why you followed after him every chance you got? She shook her head desperately, wondering where the hell the men who were supposed to be in the house were. I won't qualify that with an answer. She fought to put as much space between them as possible. Not everyone has the perversions your friends do, Reggie. If I had known that was your fascination for him, I'd have given it to you myself, he sneered. I could have used a little excitement in my bed after that stupid bitch mother of yours died. Stop! Ronnie shook her head desperately. Leave Mom out of this, Reggie. Her frail, weary mother. Ronnie trembled at the memory of her. She rarely allowed herself to remember her mother. The memories were bleak, painful. Marjorie Andrews had been too delicate, too gentle for the life Reginald had dragged her into. Leave Mom out of this, he mocked her cruelly. Fine, we'll leave dear old Mom out of it. Get your ass out the door and in my car so we can take our little trip. Why? The couch was between them, but her way to the open doorway was still blocked. Do you really think I'm stupid enough to go with you? To let you or anyone you know touch me, Reggie? It's not going to happen. How about a trade, then? He paused, watching her intently, his expression triumphant. What? He was insane. Ronnie could only blink at him in astonishment that he could even consider she would trade her own soul for anything he had. A trade, he repeated softly. You come with me, Ronnie, and let the boys do their tests, and I'll tell you why your mama fought so hard to stay hidden on that mountain. I'll tell you why she let me use her however I wanted to and however my buddies wanted to. I'll tell you, girl, who your father really is. Time seemed to stand still for Ronnie. She watched Reginald with a sense of fascinated horror and yet a grain of thankfulness, a thankfulness that went so deep it nearly made her knees weak. You're not my father. I can see that just breaks your heart, he snapped dangerously. What, you think you're too good to be my girl? I think a snake would be too good to be a child of yours, but that's just my opinion. She needed to distract him, to get him to shift position just enough for her to sprint over the couch and run for the door. As long as he faced her from the other side, though, she was trapped. So tell me, Reggie, why would I care who my father is? He can't be too important, or you would have sold the information already. Would I? He cackled. God, he actually cackled like some old crone. Weren't crones women? Course you would, Reggie. She kept her voice soothing, hoping to keep him from becoming too insistent on grabbing her. She could see the intent creeping into his expression, his body bunching in preparation. No, I wouldn't tell you this, Ronnie. Not for all the land in Texas, little girl. Not without a reason. Because it would have meant my own life. But I'll tell you now, if you come with me nice and peaceful like. Calculating and feral, his gaze reminded her of a rabid dog she had once seen. She couldn't let him get her out of the house. If she did, his advantage would be that much greater. I'm not leaving with you, she told him carefully moving farther back, watching him, knowing he had to be insane. And Tabor won't let you take me, Reginald. You won't be able to leave the estate with me. You should leave, while you can. His eyes narrowed. Your stinking little cat is too busy to worry about you, little girl, and I won't take no for an answer. He jumped for her then. Ronnie knew she would have only a second to evade him, only the slimmest chance to dart past him and run for the door— when his hand swiped for her hair, she moved. Anytime Reginald became furious with her, he would grab her hair first, hold her in place for whatever punishment he deemed necessary. She felt his fingers brush by her head as she sprinted over the couch, screaming Tabor's name. Where the hell was everyone, anyway? Bitch. She almost made it. She was clearing the couch when he caught her ankle, jerking her back with enough force to take her breath as she fought to turn her body, to shield her abdomen and the fragile life growing there. She bounced against the cushions, kicking out with her other foot as he fought to retain his grip on her. There was no breath left to scream for help. She needed her strength, her wits about her, to try to escape. 
If no one had heard her screams, then no one was close enough to help her. She kicked for his groin and missed, but the force she landed on his thigh had him stumbling back. She jumped and rolled over the couch, her ankle an agonizing ache from the harsh twist he had given it. Stumbling, she bolted for the door, screaming out Tabor's name again as she heard Reginald curse viciously behind her. I said you're going with me! He caught her hair again, this time delivering a sharp blow to the side of her head that left her dazed and crumpling to the floor from the pain. Tabor! She tried to cry out his name again, to warn him, to warn someone. But darkness was closer around her, sweeping through her mind, and she knew she only imagined the bloodthirsty animal's roar that echoed in her head. Chapter 34 Rage washed over Tabor in violent, nearly suffocating waves as he heard Ronnie's frantic screams echoing through the house. Marinus had come running for him and Callan when she had first seen Reginald sneaking into the mansion, terrified of his intent. He had been coming through the backyard when he first heard her screams. He entered the living room in time to see the bastard, fist closed, strike her temple in a blow that sent her to the floor. There was no question of mercy, no question of reigning in the rage tearing through him. His roar echoed through the room as he threw himself at the other man, desperate to alleviate the threat to his woman. Reginald was faster and in better condition than Tabor had anticipated. They rolled across the floor, the older man grunting as he slugged Tabor in the ribs with enough force to nearly take his breath and knock him back for a second. But the animal he had kept carefully leashed all the years of his adult life was free now. There would be no escape, no mercy for the man who had dared to threaten all Tabor held dear. He was aware only absently of the men now moving into the room— Ronnie was pulled to safety as Callan barked out an order to one of the others to find the doctor. She's alive, Tabor, Callan called out as Tabor faced off with Reginald. Let it go. Let the men take him. Tabor's throttled roar had Reginald paling as he stumbled backward. He rushed the older man. His fist connected with the side of Reginald's head, blood spraying as flesh tore. He jerked him from the floor as he fell, shaking him remorselessly as the older man's eyes bulged from his head. You kill me and you know what happens, Reginald wheezed as he managed to tear himself from Tabor's grip. It will be all over the news, boy. Everyone will know. Ask me if I care, Tabor growled, pacing after him as he backed away. Reginald's mouth worked desperately. I didn't hurt her. You die. Come on, man. Reginald was pleading now. He edged back along the room, trying to evade Tabor as he stalked him relentlessly. You know I didn't hurt her. Tabor stilled. He would have eased the thirst, the fury for vengeance in that second if the other man hadn't made the deciding move. Reginald pulled a small, deadly pistol from behind his back, aiming it at Tabor's chest as a smile of satisfaction washed over his face. His finger tightened on the trigger. Die, cat. Tabor threw himself to the side as the weapon discharged. Simultaneously, several others went off as well. Rolling to his feet, he watched Reginald's body jerk convulsively from the bullets slamming into his body. One in his heart, one dead center between his eyes. He fell almost in slow motion, the hollow thump of his body echoing around the room. Damn it, cat boy, how many times do I have to tell you how to kill a rabid animal? Kane snapped as he walked into the room, nudging the body carefully with his foot. Yep, that's how you do it, one bullet at a time. Tabor turned to Marinus's brother, adrenaline still coursing through him, rage beating like a spike-edged hammer at his brain. Call me cat boy again, and I'm going to shove that gun up your ass and shoot you with your own fucking bullets. He snarled furiously as he went nose to nose with Marinus's brother. You don't like what you work with? Then you get the fuck out, Kane. Kane blinked down at him, blue eyes nearly the color of Ronnie's, usually hard and cold, seemed to thaw marginally. His hands lifted to his shoulders. Truce, Kane suggested. 
Tabor breathed in harshly, shaking his head, fighting the rage that wouldn't seem to abate. How did that bastard get in the house? He turned to Callan then. I thought we had Merc on him. What the hell happened? Somehow he caught Merc unaware. Laid him out pretty good. Callan shook his head as he motioned to two of his men to drag Reginald's body from the room. We caught him, Tabor. It's over. Callan slapped him on the shoulder as he sighed wearily. Go to your woman now. She'll need you when she wakes up. Ronnie was already awake when Tabor stepped into the bedroom. Marina sat beside her on the bed, talking to her softly as Ronnie held a damp cloth to the side of her face. Her shirt was torn, her shoulders scratched, the side of her face already bruising darkly. She was the most beautiful sight he had ever seen. Is he dead? He had expected tears, maybe regret, but her eyes shone with a bitter hope that he was. I'm sorry, he whispered to her as Marinus rose to her feet and went to leave the room. Tabor, you did what you had to do. The other woman stopped beside him, her hand lifting to rub his shoulder consolingly. Don't beat yourself up over it. I'm sure there was no other choice. There was no other acceptable conclusion, Tabor thought. No man who raised a child and abused it should be allowed to live. He watched Ronnie as the door closed quietly behind Marinus, seeing the pain she tried to hide, the fear. Had he finally crossed a line she couldn't accept? He wasn't my father. Her voice cracked then. Why didn't Mama tell me he wasn't my father, Tabor? Why did she hide it from me? It was as though something had finally broken loose inside her. Tabor moved quickly to the bed, pulling her into his embrace, his heart breaking for her. I don't know, baby, he whispered painfully. She loved my father. Her fists clenched in the material of his shirt. I know she did. She told me she did. Why was she with that bastard? Why did she let him hurt her? He could feel the rage pulsing inside her, the pain of years of neglect and emotional abuse, he hadn't been able to protect her from everything, no matter how hard he had tried. And even now, he couldn't protect her from the full knowledge of the life she faced. The life their child would face. He could only hold her and pray. I would give everything I am to take this hurt from you. He moved back, staring down at her, his heart hurting for her even as his soul relished the knowledge that he held her heart. She didn't hate him. She didn't fear that animal that sometimes broke free. She accepted all of him. And if he could, he would give all he had to save her from this pain. Her eyes were dark pools of confusion, of hurt. But he could see her trust in him, her need for him. I wouldn't, she finally sighed. I wouldn't change anything, Tabor. None of it, if it meant I couldn't have all of you. The rest of it doesn't matter other than that footnote to the brutality Reginald was, I can live with it. I can't live without you. How could she do this thing to him, make his chest fill with pride with such simple words, make him feel as though he could conquer the world with only her smile to back him? You will always have me, he swore, his voice husky, the emotion filling it surprising even him. She filled every part of him. Always, Ronnie. Always, you have me. She touched his cheek. Almost convulsively, his hand rose to hers, gripping it, bringing it to his mouth as he placed a heated, soul-giving kiss into her palm. Then I'm happy, she sighed, a tired, weary little sigh. Hold me, Tabor. Lie beside me and just hold me. Rest with me. He lowered her to the bed, pulling her into his arms, holding her tightly to his chest as her head tucked beneath his chin. She settled against his body as naturally as breathing, comforting, warming. Our child will be loved, she whispered drowsily. Always, Ronnie, our child will be adored. He knew to the depths of his soul that it would be no other way. She sighed heavily, relaxing against him as the events of the past days finally sapped her remaining strength. He heard her breathing deepen, felt her body go lax, and he allowed the single tear to fall slowly from his eye. 
She was his gift, his soul. In her, salvation had come to the man who struggled daily with the animal that lurked inside him. With her, he had finally found his peace. Chapter 35 Aaron Lawrence sat still, frozen, his eyes glued to the television screen, the past rushing over him with the force of a tidal wave. The words filtering through his numb mind held little meaning. All he saw was her face, a face he had thought he would never glimpse. Veronica Andrews, daughter of Reginald and Margaret Andrews. His soul screamed out in protest. She was nothing to the bastard who had betrayed him. She was his, his child, the last connection he had to the woman who had completed his soul the woman who had run in horror from the crimes she believed he had committed. His daughter. He fought back his tears, his grief. She looked so much like her mother, the same gentle curve of her brow, the dark blue eyes, the curve of her cheek, the fear that whitened her face. The reporters were like a pack of animals as they molested her, tearing at her clothes, yelling at her, he watched the taped report, fury churning in his chest. Get their names. He didn't look at his son. Seth would take care of everything. He would know what to do now. Aaron's jaw clenched as he fought the rage building inside him. The mark on her neck was an abomination. Unnatural. For months, despite Seth's neutral stand on the breeds, Aaron had been funneling money into the attempted destruction of the animals. As he watched the news reports closer, saw the brief interview that came later, after the small wedding ceremony between his daughter and her pet, he wearily acknowledged such support would have to end, if she was happy. He frowned. What if she wasn't? What if somehow she had been forced into this? If she had, he could bring her home. He could care for her. Give her all the things he had been unable to give her throughout her life. He could be her father. That was it, he thought, hope rising within him. Seth could do this. Of course, Aaron knew he would have to convince his son to do this his way. Seth was too direct, too damned honest. There were days he would have suspected that boy was sired by another if it weren't for the fact he looked so damned much like Aaron. The same dark brown hair and steel gray eyes. The same patrician features. It was like looking into the mirror of the past when he looked at his son. But he was a good boy, Aaron reminded himself. Strong, tough. He was big enough and smart enough to get what he wanted when he wanted it. He didn't have to cheat. Not like his dad had. You can't tell her. Aaron turned to Seth now, seeing the hard purpose that lined his son's face. Promise me, Seth. I swear, if you don't tell her the truth, I'll never deceive you again. A cynical smile crossed Seth's face though he didn't look over at his father. He was staring at the television, another of the rare interviews with the full pride. You'll always lie to me, Aaron. Seth shrugged his broad shoulders in resignation. Aaron winced. He hadn't called him dad in so long, Aaron had forgotten the sound of it. You can't tell her, Seth. Grief whipped at his heart. If Seth told her the truth, she would never forgive him, never call him dad. Seth sighed deeply. I won't tell her. We'll have to be careful, Aaron warned him. We'll have to watch things first. Let your boys check it out good, real good. Make sure she's happy. Seth did glance at him then, his eyes narrowing thoughtfully. We can stay in that town, Aaron gestured to the television report. Let your boys check it out. I can get the answers. Please, Seth. Aaron put everything he had into the plea. I swear, I won't do anything. Just let me be sure, just this one time, let me be sure my way. Seth watched him closely. Aaron was more than aware of what his son saw. The old man, broken, wheelchair-bound, slowly dying. And he was dying. He was paying for his sins in the worst possible way. A slow, painful death. Aaron knew it, and he wasn't above using it. He wondered where Seth had found that wide streak of honor Aaron had cursed him for. 
Seth wiped his hand over his face tiredly. We'll see, Aaron. We'll see. He would weaken. Aaron sat back in his wheelchair, turning back to the report, his heart clenching. Pretty Veronica. His daughter. His sweet, perfect little girl. She would be home soon, he promised himself. Very, very soon. Epilogue Shara watched Cain broodingly, unable to keep her eyes from him, unable to continue to deny what her body had been telling her for months. She was going into heat. She could feel the tiny fingers of need clawing at her flesh, demanding that she give in to the instinct to breed, demanding that she go to the man who had made her his woman, his mate, over a decade before. God, had it really been that long? Over eleven years— Eleven long, torturous years she had suffered for that one night, for the fanatical plans of a brother who had been born as twisted and demented as his creators. Suffered for a man who had never loved her, had never truly needed her. If he had done either, then perhaps, just perhaps, so many other things would not have happened. Shara, baby, yes, oh hell yes, baby, let me in. The remembered words were like a knife sinking into her soul, and yet the more she fought the memories, the more vivid they became. Cain Tyler, tall, strong, his very presence had been enough to take her breath then, to fill her with a desire so strong it had nearly overwhelmed her. His touch had seared her senses, his kiss, she whimpered. She wouldn't remember the kiss wouldn't remember how her heart had clenched at the stroke of his tongue. A shiver worked over her body as she jerked to her feet, forcing herself away from the window, away from the sight of Cain moving with confident, arrogant power across the yard. How much longer would Marinus hold her secret, she wondered, as she pushed her fingers through the long fall of hair that fell forward over her face. How much longer before the sister informed the brother of the child he had lost all those years ago? the child that had been murdered while still in her womb. Her hand moved to her abdomen, running over it with a ghost's touch as her womb rippled in need. How often had she dreamed of what that child could have been, dreamed of a precocious son with his father's deep blue eyes, or a daughter with his long black hair, a child that would have been the best of both of them. Shara fought back her tears, fought back all the useless dreams, the hopes that had once filled her. Life had taught her that there was no chance to redeem the past, no sense in regretting what could not be undone. I love you, Shara. His remembered words whispered through her mind. I'll be back, baby, I swear it. I'll be back and I'll bring help. But he had never returned. He had never come back for her. The scientists had been ecstatic to learn she was breeding, Every precaution had been taken to ensure the life of the child, every precaution except that of a mind bent on death, her baby's death. The whimper that echoed around her couldn't be hers, she assured herself. She had cried for that lost child years before, cried until her soul bled out with the salty moisture of her pain, cried until there had been nothing left inside her heart but an empty shell, until Cain had returned. And with him, so had the memories she had fought so desperately. Ah, oh, Shara, yes, baby, so tight, so hot and tight. Her pussy tightened convulsively at the remembered feel of his cock pushing inside it. He had watched. She remembered that. Watched as every inch of his powerful erection sank into the burning depths of her hairless cunt. He had been fascinated by that lack of hair, had loved licking the plump lips, feeling her juices slide against his tongue. Stop, she whispered, her fingers pushing into her hair, gripping it, hoping the pain would tear through the veil of heartache. They had had only one night, only eight stolen hours during a time when he was supposed to be training her. He had trained her, but not in the lessons he had been ordered to deliver. He had trained her to his cock instead trained her to his kiss, to the touch of his hands, trained her to love, and then later, to hate. She couldn't seem to rid herself of the hatred, 
no matter the fact that he had been as powerless as she. Diane. He had been her brother, her confidant. He had been one of the few people she had trusted. His betrayal had been the worst. He had tried to kill Cain, Marinissa told her. It had been he who had slipped the drug into her food, the drug that forced the unwanted abortion on her already weak body. It had been her brother who had destroyed all that Shara was. And now, here she was, eleven years later, her body tormented with a lust she couldn't seem to control, her heart breaking with memories she could no longer fight. God, yes, suck my cock, baby. Yes, Shara, oh, hell, oh, hell. He had tried to pull back, to keep from spilling his seed into her mouth, but she had been desperate for the taste of his essence, desperate to know every facet of the act they were engaged in. She licked her lips at the remembered taste. When are you going to tell him? Merck stood at the doorway of the office, staring back at her with bitter, hollow eyes. He knew, she thought, knew well the pain of losing all that mattered in his life. Who said I was going to? There was no hiding from the fact that he knew she was in heat. Hell, they all knew. Her scent was only undetectable by Cain. Only he was unaware of what her body was going through. You can't hide it from him forever. He's not a fool. He shook his head as he crossed his arms over his powerful chest. It's time to let go of the past, Shara. She snarled. Fine advice for you to be giving, she snapped. When you're strong enough to accept your own past, Mercury, then you can bitch at me for not accepting mine. It was a low blow. Shara shook her head as she groaned in misery. Merc, I'm sorry. He sighed wearily. No more than the truth. But you have a chance now, Shara. Your mate still lives, and he's more than ready to ease the pain beginning to build within you. Why fight it? Don't you deserve more than this? To any of us? She whispered. I can't, Mark. I can't. She couldn't face losing another child. She couldn't face losing Cain all over again. Too many years. Too much anger. He's your man, he said simply. Soon he won't take no for an answer. What will you do then? What will you do when he learns the truth you've hidden from him since he found you? A tired, bitter smile crossed her lips. I don't know, she sighed bleakly. I just don't know. And maybe that's the part that truly, truly terrifies me, Merc. I don't know if I can face his punishment. Merc shook his head slowly. Start counting the days, Shara. Because soon, very soon, there won't be any more hiding. He'll know, and when he does, he'll show you why he's your man. Maybe then you'll realize the futility in fighting. He turned and left the room, and in that moment she realized how right he was. Soon she wouldn't be able to hide her needs. They would invade every cell of her body, rendering her helpless and in such heat she'd be screaming for relief. She knew. She knew because it was a cycle. Every year, every long, wasted year she had been apart from him, she had suffered. Suffered until death had seemed the only viable alternative. Suffered until she had cursed him, hated him, and finally, in a last desperate move, had assured herself and nature that no child would ever come of her body. She had tricked Doc into sterilizing her and destroying forever a chance at the child and the man stolen from her. She had done the unthinkable, and now she would suffer more. As always, alone. This book is over, but the story continues. Keep listening after the credits to hear the beginning of Kiss of Heat, book three in the Feline Breeds series, Free. This has been an Audible Inc. production of The Man Within, written by Laura Lee, narrated by Stella Bloom, executive producer Susie Bright, producer Mike Charzik, copyright 2004 by Laura Lee, Production Copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. And now, a free preview of Kiss of Heat, Book 3 in the Feline Breeds series. Prologue 
Sandy Hook. Shara stood silently in the shadows of the motel, watching carefully. Her eyes narrowed as the nine men parted company and went to their respective rooms. They were furious, but one was coldly dangerous. She had watched them at the airport after dropping Doc off at the safe house, then followed them to Sandy Hook and watched as they checked in. Kane didn't remind her of Marinus in any way. He was darker-haired, the color nearly black, with intense, cold blue eyes. His strong jaw and high cheekbones gave a hint to Native American ancestry, his hard, graceful body hinting at extensive military training. She knew the look, the way a killer moved. She had grown up among them, been raped by them more than once. But this one, she knew personally. This man had brought her pleasure. Despite her pleas, despite her wishes to the contrary, he had taken her beneath the unfeeling eye of a camera, riding her from one climax to the next, his lust fueled by hers and hers by his touch. Had it only been eleven years ago? Sweet heaven, that night tormented her even now, as though it had happened only yesterday. The dark soldier who had sworn to help her, to rescue her. He had come to her, holding freedom in one hand, her heart in the other, and spent the night teaching her the pleasures of her woman's body. When he left, he never returned. But the doctors had. They had returned her to her cell with the video they had taped of the night she spent with him. They had snickered at the things Kane Tyler had done to her, that she had done to him, all in the name of science. Rape had not impregnated her. They had wondered if pleasure would. She was a breed. As she had been taught in the Genetics Council's labs, she wasn't human. She was an animal in human form, nothing more. Even now, ten years after her freedom from those labs, she wasn't certain which she was, human or animal. She knew for a very brief time, in this man's arms, she had become a woman. And she would hate him for it until she drew her last breath. She had been created, not born, trained, not raised. When Cain touched her, she had lived. When he deceived her, she had lost the only thing that ever mattered in her life, and now, life or death, it didn't matter. All that mattered was the survival of the pride itself. Their sanctuary here in Sandy Hook had been compromised in ways that could never be repaired now. They were, once again, homeless. Homeless and hunted. Her hands clenched into fists of rage as Cain lingered outside his room, lazily finishing a cigarette he had lit moments earlier. She wanted to kill him now. She had sworn she would kill him if she ever found him again, sworn she would see to it that he paid for every moment of pain she suffered all those years ago. She had sworn he would pay for lying to her and for doing it so easily without her knowledge. He had betrayed her, just as he had betrayed his sister. His expression hardened when the last door finally closed and he was left alone with her. Where's Marinus? His voice was savage, pulsating with a fury that sent a frisson of unease through her body. How had he known she was there, watching him, waiting? And why the fuck weren't we met at the airport as promised? I have a better question, she said from the safety of the shadows. Why would a brother betray a sister he swears to love on the eve of promised help? He turned around slowly, casually, until he was facing her. She saw hard purpose in his face and surprise. What the hell are you talking about? A full team of soldiers swept over Callan's house. A dozen men. All I know for sure is that they didn't get him or Marinus. But I know they want her. They know about her. Know what, for God's sake? He raked his fingers through his hair, his voice quiet but rough with fury. Why the hell would they attack now? They know your sister has made it with Callan, she told him carefully, just as you knew. Or had he? She watched his face pale alarmingly, his blue eyes widening. That bastard touched her? He snarled. No, she drawled mockingly. He made it with her. 
Surely you remember the concept. And now the council no longer cares if they take him alive or dead. They want the woman and any child she carries. But you already knew that, didn't you, Mr. Tyler? Why else would they attack mere hours after talking to you? He shook his head slowly. I never betrayed my sister. I wouldn't. His voice sent a chill down her spine. Shara frowned. I came to kill you, Kane Tyler, she said carefully. He didn't seem surprised now. His mouth was edged with mockery. Perhaps you could delay that little attempt long enough for me to save my sister's ass, he growled. What the hell is this mating shit? Later, she snapped. Now is not the time for explanations. Now is the time for you to tell me how the council learned of the mating if Marinus didn't tell you of it. And Shara was nearly certain he hadn't known. He was a liar, but in this one instance, he was telling the truth. Her gifts had grown through the years, with maturity and desperation. She could now smell a lie as others could, diseased trash. Who are you? His voice sizzled. And you're going to have to be a little more forthcoming than you have been, woman. I can't help Marinus or Callan with so little information. Taking a deep breath, Shara stepped from the shadows. She watched his eyes widen, saw the suspicion turn to knowledge. You aren't dead, he whispered, blinking, as though trying to assure himself she was there. His expression went slack with shock, his eyes gleaming beneath the low lights with at first something resembling hope, then with fury. Bitterness filled her with a wave of pain so intense she nearly drowned beneath it. He was furious now, and he had no right to be. No, lover, I wasn't killed. But that doesn't mean you have much longer to live. Shara faced her past now as she never had before. Nightmares and broken hopes fragmented around her, drawing her soul into a bleak, dark void she feared she could never escape. She felt the surging lust, the need, just as Callan and Marinus knew it, thundering through her blood, through her very being. Before her stood the man who had betrayed her years before, in a bleak, cold lab, his body laboring over her, throwing her into pleasure despite every barrier she put up against it. Her mate. The father of the child she had lost. The one man she had sworn to kill. She was alive. Cain stared at her, hiding the tremble in his hands, the need welling inside him like a dark, hungry cloud. How many years had he dreamed of her, needed her, longed for her with every fiber of his being? And now she was here, standing before him, shrouded in darkness, her eyes glittering with hatred. Hatred. He swallowed past the emotion clogging his throat, the regret lancing his chest and the disbelief he couldn't seem to shake. As though the world had shifted on its axis, pitching him into a world that was as different as it was the same the day before. Why didn't you contact me? He could barely force the words past his lips. She was alive, had been all these years. He had suffered through hell, ached until he swore his soul was a raw, open wound, and all this time she had been alive. She sneered, a cold curve to her lips that twisted in his soul as he watched her. Fingers as slender and graceful as life itself reached beside her to pluck a delicate white blossom from the thick bush at her side. They tore at the petals, ripping them casually from their delicate mooring and leaving them to drift in wounded splendor to the ground. Staring at her was tearing his soul to pieces. Realizing she had been alive, all this time, free, and she hadn't contacted him, hadn't even bothered to let him know, was destroying the last thread of sanity he thought he had held on to all these years. God damn you, he snarled, fury surging inside him so hot, so deep it blistered the open wounds her death had left years ago. All these fucking years and not even a goddamned phone call, Shara? Nothing? He had to clench his fingers into fists to keep from jerking her to him, to hold back the lust and burning rage filling his mind. He was literally seeing red. The haze at the edge of his vision rippled and burned, turning the soft fall of the hotel lights into a bloody aura. 
Her gaze flickered over him, cold, unemotional, filled with victorious triumph. And I would have done that, why? She bared her teeth, her hatred crisp, clear, lining the beauty of her expression with remorseless hatred. He fell back a step, feeling the blow to the pit of his soul. He had bled for her, had nearly died for her, for this, her hatred. No reason. His voice was hoarse, and he hated her for that, hated the emotion tearing his heart to pieces as she watched him with the glimmer of amusement in her eyes. No reason at all. Marinus was all that mattered now, his sister and the man who held her. Where's my sister? She's safe, she shrugged again. That's all you need to know. He moved before she could blink. He had known his only edge would be whatever surprise he could gain. He took the advantage fiercely. His hands caught her wrists, twisting them quickly behind her back, holding them in a steel-hard grip as he pushed her roughly against the side of the motel. Wrong, he snarled. That is not all I need to know, nor is it all you will tell me. By God, I nearly died for you and your fucking pride once, but I'll be damned if Marinus will be hurt any further. His free hand gripped the long, silken hair, his fingertips transmitting the sensation of cool, perfect pleasure to his brain even as he fought it. Her body pressed against him, still unyielding as her eyes widened in shock. You're crazy, she snapped. No more games, Cain. You betrayed us all. He wanted to shake her, wanted to howl in misery. You believe what the hell you want to now, Shara. I really don't give a fuck. But you will tell me what the hell is going on, and you will do it now, or so help me God I'll make you wish you had. Hunger ambushed him. His cock swelled to painful, immediate erection. His mouth watered for the taste of her. The scent of her body made him sweat, made his balls draw up in lust. Eleven fucking years. Eleven years without her, craving her taste, her touch. For what? For fucking nothing. You will tell me. He pressed his cock into her lower belly, watched her pale, watched the fear that flickered in the shadows of her eyes as his heart twisted in misery. Or I'll show you, lover, the bastard you believe I can be. Only Marinus mattered. For now. Chapter One Five Months Later Afternoon, Kitty. Kane's deliberate drawl as Shara entered the kitchen, prepared for the weekly meeting Callan insisted on, had the hair on the back of her neck rising in instant defense. That drawl never indicated a pleasant conversation where Kane was involved. It wasn't as if any conversation she had with him was ever pleasant. He insisted on provoking her at every opportunity, and generally did his level best to see just how angry he could make her. His blue eyes were cool, calculating, watching her with an amused mockery that made her ache to scratch them out. That need was in direct conflict with the overpowering urge to fuck him silly. She was in heat. She hated it, but had no choice except to admit to it. After eleven long years of pain and fear, she now knew why her body turned traitor on her, beginning with an overwhelming arousal and ending with a bleak, almost agonizing pain before slowly diminishing. For one month of each year, she had been going into heat, and she had suffered because her mate had already taken her, had already programmed her body to accept no other touch but his. If he had been a breed, she could have understood it. Marinus and Ronnie had been marked by their mates, their bodies conditioned by the hormonal fluids that eased from the swollen glands just under the men's tongues. But Shara knew that on the single night she had spent with Cain, her own hormonal glands hadn't been active. And she sure as hell hadn't made the mistake of kissing him since he had barged back into her life, not since learning the signs of the mating heat and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that Cain was her mate. He was leaning negligently against the kitchen counter, cup in hand, his tall, leanly muscled body relaxed and tempting. His jeans bulged between his thighs. She swallowed, dragging her gaze away from him. He was hard and ready to fuck. And only God knew just how badly she wanted him to come into her, strong and thick, his cock surging up her wet pussy until she screamed. 
She almost shivered at the thought as heat rushed over her, through her. Oh, now there's something interesting. His amused voice was pitched low as he obviously caught the betraying color. What's the blush for, kitten? Getting overheated. Turning from him, she pretended nonchalance as she laid the files on the table in preparation for the rest of the pride's arrival. Cain, you're starting to irritate me, she told him coolly without turning back. The cute little remarks are getting on my nerves. Keep it up and I'll show you how a feline really fights. He grunted, the sound filled with sarcasm. Be nice, Shara, or I'll sick our little angel on you. She'll bite you, remember? Cassie had actually growled at her the day before when Shara had snapped at Kane over something he said. The little girl was amazingly protective of him. Shara glanced back at Kane as she shook her head in pity. Poor Cassie. She was learning such bad habits from him. We promised to keep her away from you, she said. Kane was not a good influence on the child. You're going to turn her into a little monster if you keep spoiling her the way you are. He smiled with smug amusement. Beats the little doll you and Marinus would turn her into, he retorted. Let the kid be a kid, damn it. It's not like she's had much chance in the past two years. That was no more than the truth. From Dash Sinclair's reports, the little girl had lived through a nightmare of constant attacks and desperate flights as her mother fought to keep her safe. She was the first known wolf-breed child to be conceived outside a test tube, and the price on her head was astronomical. But that didn't mean Cain had to turn a perfectly sweet child into such a little tomboy. She's a little girl, not a ruffian. Shara turned on him with a frown. Cain, you had her in a mud fight yesterday. There is no excuse for that this late in the year. He smiled, a slow, deliberate curve of his lips as his blue eyes filled with glee. I know. Damn, that girl has good aim, doesn't she? And it wasn't that cold. It was warm as hell and she was having a good time. That's all that was required. Kane and Cassie had both been covered in mud from head to toe. The minute Shara had stepped out the door, berating Kane for the mess, a blob of the gooey earth had spattered against the side of her head. The little angel, once known as Cassie Colder, had informed her quite ferociously that she was a wolf and Shara was a cat, and if she wasn't very nice to Kane, then she was going to get bitten. At the rate she's going, I'm going to have to put you both on a leash, she told him heatedly. Stop encouraging her. She's just a child. In a second, his expression went from smug laughter to intense, dark sexuality. A leash, huh? His voice turned velvet rough, his gaze dropping to her breasts as they rose beneath the cotton t-shirt she wore. She could feel her nipples hardening. Can we include handcuffs? I have some, you know. Heat erupted between her thighs. Damn him and his teasing. He was only stoking the progression of her heat, making it harder for her to fight. And he was going to insist on making it worse. Could the day get any worse, she asked herself sarcastically. Only if you're the one in them, she snapped back, trying to ignore the image of him chained to her bed, straining beneath her as she lowered herself on the rigid length of his erection. The vision was too tempting to allow for long. Unfortunately, her caustic words had little effect on him. Her insults rarely gained her so much as a glimmer of irritation within those dark eyes but it did gain her the scent of hot, aroused male. She could smell his lust now, like the rush of a sudden thunderstorm slamming into her senses. His eyes glittered, his expression darkening with hunger. If she looked lower, she knew that bulge in his jeans would more closely resemble a thick steel rod eager for release. That could be arranged, he murmured agreeably as he stepped closer his heavy body moving with fluid grace and male power. My room or yours? She was going to orgasm from the sheer intensity in his voice alone. Shara felt her pussy flood with her juices, felt the hard ache of her nipples beneath the cloth of her shirt, and wanted to hiss in fury. Why couldn't life for just one year be kind to her? She wondered in dejection. What had she done to deserve this? Only in your dreams. She managed to drag the derisive words past her lips. He chuckled then, 
The sound was low, stroking over her already inflamed nerves as he moved closer to her. She wasn't about to retreat. If she did, he would only follow her. If he followed her, he would learn just how desperate she was to keep as much distance as possible between them. You have no idea, baby. Want me to tell you a few of them? He paused before her, his broad chest no more than inches from her breasts. She fought to keep her breathing slow and even, but she was aware of the fact she was failing. And she knew he was. His head lowered as he watched her breasts rise harder before he lifted his lashes, staring back at her suggestively. No. She shook her head, trying to turn from him. She didn't need to hear about his dreams. The temptation of his touch was too great. My favorite one. He ignored her denial as his hand moved, his knuckles running lightly up her arm. Is the one where I have you stretched over my lap, turning your ass a bright, pretty red for teasing me for so long. You squirming and begging for my cock each time I spank one of those rounded little cheeks. I would be more than happy to reenact it for you, he offered, with all appearances of polite consideration. She should be outraged. Instead, Shara stared back at him with shock and fought the clench of her buttocks at the thought of his hands descending on them in such a manner. Oh, yeah, she could envision that one as well. Too well. That's quite all right, Kane. She sniffed with as much dignity as she could muster amid the overwhelming hunger rippling inside her. You can just enjoy your little perversions alone. God gave men a hand and five fingers for a reason, you know. Hmm, I know. And I know for a fact just how well I can make those fingers fit my favorite little kitty, too. Come here, purr baby, let me show you. Dangerous. Warning. His voice was like an addictive narcotic flooding her system despite the edge of fury she could see lingering in his gaze. Cream flooded her cunt. She could feel it seeping from her vagina and slickening her labial folds with its thick essence. Keeping control wasn't easy to accomplish. Not when her tongue literally throbbed to share her pain with him and her vagina clenched in agreement. Damn him. She didn't need this right now. It would serve him right if she gave him what he kept tempting her to. The rich potency of the hormone would be a fitting punishment for the months of arousal he had put her through. Kane, Shara, no fighting today. Callan saved her from having to drag a scathing retort from her suddenly vacant mind when he walked into the kitchen, followed by his wife and the rest of the main pride. Let's get down to business and see if we can get something accomplished this time. The last several meetings had been so unproductive as to make a mockery of his determination to ensure the breeds a place in society, not as a separate species, but as human beings deserving of life. That seemed to be the current debate waging among the inner circles of more than one government body. Okay, what do we have? Callan asked as they all sat down. Shara, did you get those estimates? Everything. She pushed one of the files to her pride, brother. Farside does excellent construction work, Callan. I've researched every angle, and they look like our best bet. I disagree. Kane did no more than she expected as he took his seat as well. He disagreed with everything she said lately. It would require too many unknowns on the property at once and create a risk we don't need. That makes them more than untrustworthy. It makes them a hazard. Shara gritted her teeth for long seconds before she turned to him with a snarl. Farside Construction is one of the most respected construction firms in the nation. Their buildings have very high ratings for workmanship, they don't hire subcontractors, and they make certain the work is of excellent quality from start to finish. Saying they are untrustworthy could be considered libelous, Kane. Shara snapped. He was once again being difficult. For some reason he thought it his job in life to make living an even greater hell for her than it already was. Adrenaline pumped through her veins, making her insides tremble, her womb flex in need. Anger always made it worse. Made the heat spread through her body like a conflagration she had no hope of controlling. Settle down, Shara. He said he didn't trust them, Callan reminded her as her gaze locked with Kane's. We have to be certain who we're dealing with before we let them in on the property, especially with Cassie here. As though she didn't know that. She felt like hissing in sheer frustration. It's a meeting. 
she argued, turning to Callan. I've busted my ass to get these files together and come up with the best choices for the work that needs to be completed. If he keeps shooting them down, we'll be building the damned houses ourselves. Which makes more sense, purr baby, Kane sniped, his ever-present knowing smirk tilting his lips. We have enough hands here, and it's not like they weren't trained at damn near everything. What's the point in wasting money as well as manpower when we would be out no more than materials to do it ourselves? Irritation was beginning to thicken Kane's voice, as though he was growing tired of the ever-present battle between them. Which was too bad. He started it. His sniping and mocking comments continually battered away at her, and she was growing sick of it. Because it takes away from the defense of the compound itself, she snapped back. Bullshit. He was frowning now, his dark blue eyes blazing. You forgot who head of security is here, kitten. Me. I know exactly what it takes to defend this compound, and it doesn't nearly take two hundred breeds at any given time to do so. Let your people do the work. It will build a sense of responsibility as well as pride in the home they've taken. You seem to forget the fact that most of these men and women you're talking about need a chance to rest and recuperate, not work their asses off all day. She planted her hands on the table, snarling back at him as she thought of the dull-eyed men and women who had been rescued from various labs over the past months. You can't coddle them like this, Shara. He was nearly in her face now as the others watched in interest. You're not going to help them by babying them as though everything was going to be just hunky-dory from now on. It's not. What they face isn't going to be a hell of a lot safer than those damned labs they were in if they're not careful. You can't let them think it will be. Shara could feel the blood suddenly pumping through her veins, her loins heating, her breasts tingling in response to the confrontation between them now. A sharp kick of arousal tightened her womb, nearly taking her breath as adrenaline surged through her bloodstream. There was nothing so arousing as a fight with this man. She normally avoided it at all costs, but today? Frustration was like a rabid animal eating at her self-control. She was sick of his sniping sick of biting her tongue and keeping her mouth shut rather than pushing them both into something she feared she would regret. I'll be damned if I'll use them like slave labor as you suggest, Shara sneered back at him. This isn't the Middle Ages, and you aren't some petty dictator being allowed to take over. Kane sat back in his chair, his eyes narrowing in anger as he watched her. She could feel his intent gaze, like a caress over her face, assessing her response. Seeing too much. He did that a lot. Watching her like a damned bug under a microscope whenever they were in the same room together. So pay them a wage. He finally drawled mockingly. No one suggested they do it for free. You're still going to come out ahead without the added danger that allowing others into the compound will bring. Enough, Shara. Callan overrode the furious words getting ready to spew from her lips. She wanted to tear into Kane with a desperation that had her fingers curling into claws against the table. You both have a good argument, but we have to come to a decision tonight. Good luck, Kane grunted sarcastically as he watched her. Kitten here seems more determined to see us all dead at the moment than to have houses built. Shara felt a bead of sweat forming on her brow as he smirked at her. His eyes were dark, intent, watching her closely. She could feel him pushing her knew he was, and was helpless against the urge to fight back. She had to fight back, had to show him she wasn't weak, she wasn't timid. On the heels of that thought came the knowledge that her heat was what was actually pushing her. Instinct, to prove to him she was strong enough to take him, strong enough to fight by his side and challenge his strength, and the need to do so was becoming stronger. Daily she could feel her own aggression surging in her body and it terrified her. He's irrational, Callan. She fought to sit back and relax as she glanced at the head of the table where Callan watched them both with a frown. The man is so damned paranoid you'll be out there pounding nails instead of making decisions for the pride soon. Give it a break, Shara. Kane's voice was filled with impatience. I need Callan to look after Marinus. You can't seem to keep her out of trouble. Shara turned back to him, incredulous at the accusation. Suddenly she had gone from coddling the exhausted breeds to being unable to protect Marinus? Me? She snarled, gripping the table in fury. I wasn't the one who took her out on the motorcycle the other day. That was you. All I did was help her clean the stupid closet out. She almost fell on her head, damn it. 
I told you to keep that woman out of closed spaces. She's a hazard in them, didn't you pay attention? I am not your sister's keeper, she yelled. How am I supposed to make sense of the crazy things she wants to do? She's your damned sister. She was on her feet now, her finger pointing across the table in accusation as she faced him. She was sick of playing babysitter to an eight-year-old who knew more than she should, as well as a woman who didn't seem to know how to move her feet in a closet. Well, hell, excuse me. I thought you two should have enough in common to at least be able to walk and talk at the same damn time together. He drawled mockingly. You should take lessons from her, Shara. Being in heat the way you are, you should have the sense to at least pay attention when she messes up. You might want to learn from it. She felt the blood drain from her face. Reality became limited to the dark, knowing depths of his eyes and the challenge sparkling there. You're insane. She tried to find the fury of moments before, but could barely manage to breathe past the shock instead. He laughed, though the sound was mocking, filled with anger as he came to his feet and faced her with a tight smile. Am I? he said. Or do you think you can hide something else from me? Sorry, baby, I'm not nearly as stupid as you seem to think I am. And you want to know what else I'm aware of? He leaned closer, his hands flattening on the table as he came almost nose to nose with her. Her senses were filled with the scent of him, the smell of hot, furious mail wrapped around her, nearly strangling her with hunger. What do you think you know? She tried to snarl back, but her voice was weak, wary. Now she understood the warning glimmer of anger that had burned in his eyes when she first entered the kitchen. Kane was flat pissed, and that was not a good thing. What I know, he said with brutal clarity, is that you're in heat, Shara, and I know who your mate is. I know because it's me. He straightened then, staring back at her, seeming angrier at the knowledge than anything else. Just like I know about the baby, the sterilization, and your fucking stubbornness for the last few months. I know it all, and I'll be damned if you'll get away with any of it for even one day longer. We hope you enjoyed this free preview of Kiss of Heat, book three in the Feline Breed series. To keep the story going, get the complete book today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.